of Concepts and Methods by K. Morali, also known as Ajith, Part 2. The Working of the Neocolonial Mind Quote, that the 1991 reforms marked a major watershed in India's economic history is surely beyond argument. No waiting lists for cars and scooters, no special license for securing foreign exchange for studying abroad, no gold smuggling, and no more the dread of customs officers at the airports, unquote. Rajiv Kumar. Quote, the world has changed substantially since the 1990s, and so has India. The country is now carving out a niche in the global markets, which has so far been dominated by developed countries, unquote. National Institution for Transforming India. These quotes were taken from issues of the Economic and Political Weekly, EPW. The consumerist glee seen in the first is of someone wholly supportive of the neoliberal turn taken by the Indian state in 1991. Rajiv Kumar, presently the vice chair of the NITI, had some concerns about the inequality that accompanied it. Still, he believed that this could be handled and resolved, continuing with a neoliberal agenda adjusted to India. Greater integration with the world economy was declared as a, quote, major achievement, unquote. Above all, he was quite certain that the reforms had a very large dose of indigenous inputs. He claims that they were based on domestic research and advocacy. The second quote is from someone addressing a very different concern. Ramdas Rupvath was writing about the discrimination and humiliation suffered by the Dalit and Adivasi students in institutions of higher education. Well aware of the social economic roots of the prejudices they are victims of, he squarely targeted the Varnal caste system as antisocial and antinational. He also pointed out that the opportunities became even more unequal and uncertain post liberalization. The fruits of its growth went to a tiny rich class. Coming from distinctly different spaces, Kumar and Rupavath articulate sharply different concerns. Yet, as seen in these quotes, both are convinced about one thing India has arrived on the world stage. Indeed, this is a dominant theme among a great majority of the middle class, and that includes many otherwise critical of the state of affairs in the country. It is almost an article of faith, an unquestionable frame of reference. It was also the overriding theme of most of the articles published in newspapers and magazines marking the 25th anniversary of the 1991 reforms. Many of them made it a point to deny any foreign compulsion and insisted on their indigenous origins. Montek Singh Aluwaila's article is symptomatic of this viewpoint. Refuting allegations that these reforms were imposed by the IMF, he writes, quote, this completely ignores the fact that there was a homegrown process of rethinking on economic policy that had been underway and pointed towards many changes. These changes certainly formed part of the conditionality of the IMF's assistance, because the IMF is supposed to lend only in situations where the government has a credible adjustment program. The IMF obviously approved the reforms in that sense, but that is not the same thing as saying it dictated the contents." Unquote. He then goes on to enumerate various proposals and initiatives, beginning from the late 1970s onwards, aimed at changing economic policy. They culminated in a paper he authored in 1990. Its contents mostly anticipated the reforms of 1991. Aluwaila cites the discussion of this paper in a Government of India, GOI Committee of Secretaries, as proof of these proposals, quote, being considered internally, well before any IMF arrangements were contemplated, unquote. We need not dispute this account given by a leading architect of the 1990 reforms. But does it really settle the matter? Can the mere fact of a policy paper being discussed by some GOI secretaries, or the policy shift carried out since the 1990s, determine that the reforms were of internal origin? Aluwaila supplies the answer in his unwitting admission. The policy changes proposed by the Narisimha Rao government were precisely those that formed the conditionalities of the IMF loan. They were directed towards ensuring structural adjustments suited to the neoliberal agenda. They were not advisory in nature. A country seeking IMF assistance could not amend or reject them. They were inviolable, an imposition. That is the crux of the matter. It stands confirmed by the fact that almost all third world countries had to adopt some more policy shifts during that period. An imposition need not take the form of an explicit diktat. It could be well achieved through the loan-seeking government pre-indicating willingness to fulfill IMF conditions. Considering that the prior acceptance of a structural adjustment program was a must, it would make eminent sense for a desperate government to declare its compliance well in advance. Keep in mind that while the balance of payment crisis was brought to quick maturation by the first Gulf War, the motion towards it was already evident by the late 1980s. 
Therefore, the fact that the policy shift was proposed and debated upon, even before approaching the IMF, really doesn't prove Aldo Weilo's claim. The collapse of the Soviet Union had a direct impact on the Indian economy. It severely weakened the Indian ruling class. They had to fall in line with the Washington Consensus and accept the neoliberal globalization, privatization, and liberalization GPL agenda promoted by the U.S., now the sole superpower. Whether as an IMF conditionality or not, structural adjustments to give free play to neoliberal policies were inevitable. Later structural adjustments incorporating the GPL agenda became a permanent, inviolable condition, an inseparable part of the Indian economy and of other third world economies through the 1993 GATT Agreement and the World Trade Organization's WTO directives. All of this is long since public knowledge. Why do Awulaila and Kumar then persist in insisting on the domestic pedigree of the 1991 reforms? Theirs is not an attempt at covering up. No, they wholeheartedly believe that in full view of the facts and that makes it worth probing further. What immediately strikes one is the blurring of the distinction between the internal and external. There has been a continuous exchange of technocrats and academicians between the GOI and various Indian institutions and imperialist agencies like the World Bank, IMF, and Asian Development Bank, ADB. This became particularly noticeable from the 1980s onwards. Manmohan Singh, Aluwaila himself, Raghuram Rajan, Arvind Subramanian, and Arvind Panaragaya, and Yerjit Patel, these some of the recent examples. Those who serve at the IMF and similar agencies are inevitably conditioned by the current set of ideas or policy framework being prescribed by them. When these technocrats came back to occupy key positions in GOI and articulate policy, they are invariably guided, inspired by the thinking that they imbibed and argued for while working in these imperialist agencies. Kumar's claim about the Indian origin of the reforms brings this out very well. His justification is that researchers, quote, well-versed in the Indian ground realities, unquote, had presented reform measures in a, quote, readily comprehensible form, unquote, to take political leadership and other policymakers well before the formal acceptance of the IMS conditionalities. Kumar added a note to his article to prove this. It informs us about a study prepared by a team, including himself, for the ADB in 1989. In his words, quote, it is noteworthy that many of these measures, i.e. those proposed in the study, were replicated in the structural reforms matrix presented by the IMF, unquote, as a conditionality for its loan. There is nothing surprising about this replication. After all, the ADB is a key player among imperialist agencies. Going by the information Kumar provides, there is also nothing surprising about his considering an external, foreign set of ideas as internally generated. For people like him and Aluwaila, this only appears as a seamless flow of ideas which they share and willingly act upon. For them, there is nothing separating the indigenous from the foreign in this matter. This approach is by no means restricted to IMF WB returnees. A great many Akkadians and all top-level administrators are tutored or directly trained in imperialist thinking. Quite naturally enough, the contribution they make to governance and economic policies remains within the framework of imperialist thought. Nothing is imposed. The external is internalized. Its articulation becomes country-specific without even a trace of its foreign origins. Whether they be foreign returnees or home-based ones, consideration of the Indian economy as one enmeshed, not integrated, in the global imperialist system is simply missing. This stands in sharp contrast to the thinking of the local elites during the colonial period. They could not be acutely aware of British India's dependent status and its debilitating consequences. The British origins and biases of policies executed by the colonial administration were all too plain. Hence, even while remaining loyal subjects of the British Empire, some among them produced weighty studies exposing the plunder of the imperial metropolis and expressing local interests in opposition to metropolitan capital. The transfer of power in 1947 promoted a transition from this mindset to a new one. To get an idea of this transformation and the characteristics of the new consciousness, we must first get acquainted with the colonial mind and the mind of the elite colonial subject. Awestruck by the political and economic might of the colonial power and grieving one's own backwardness, such was its main character. The local elites were eager to imitate the colonial masters in all public spheres of their lives. The metropolis was acclaimed as the model to aspire to. Yet the colonial mind was also quite disgruntled. Even the richest, even those with royal lineage, or those who had demonstrated academic acumen, were still treated as inferior, quote, locals, unquote, by colonial masters. They remain lesser subjects compared to those in colonies populated by, quote, whites, unquote. They were denied dominion status. Dissatisfaction engendered by such discrimination, coupled with the drain of wealth, 
crystallized over time into a political opposition expressed as anti-colonialism, the Indian National Congress was its main articulator and vehicle. For the new rulers who came to power in 1947 and their ideologues, independence was nothing more than the ending of colonial rule, hence they sincerely believed that they were engaged in building an independent country. This was not simply a false image meant to deceive the people. They were quite convinced about its feasibility. By 1947, an elite intellectual stratum had taken form. It was composed of elements from the comprador, feudal, and upper middle classes. They became the formulators and executors of economic measures adopted by the new state. A good many were driven by a zeal to build an India capable of taking a prominent role in the world arena. Brahmanist claims about a glorious past and a desire to retake it were intertwined with their ambitions. Getting rid of economic backwardness was their priority, but their very class nature ruled out radical reforms in agriculture and other spheres. Considering the building of an industrial base as a necessary condition and constrained by paucity of capital and technology, they eagerly sought foreign aid. Initially, some imperialist powers like the U.S. were opposed to their plans. The new rulers succeeded in crossing this obstacle by relying on other powers. The whole experience in similar instances in other fields went to further strengthen the illusion of independence. Sharp contradictions between the capitalist bloc and the erstwhile socialist camp and later between the two superpower blocs, led by the U.S. and the erstwhile Soviet social imperialism, allowed room for their maneuvering and bargaining. The uppermost strata were well aware of India's actual dependent position in the world order. Their immediate dealings with the world powers repeatedly underlined this real status, especially during recurring crisis. But it was realized as limits on their independence, not as limitations inherent to it. The middle class, distant from such experiences, was however firmly convinced of India's quote importance unquote in world affairs as an independent country. It was quite taken in by ruling class hype. Such are the main characteristics of the neo-colonial mind in India. It mainly manifests as a sense of independence, even while the country remains dependent. Formal independence of erstwhile colonies is an essential feature, a vital requirement of neo-colonialism. That distinguishes it from colonialism. Instead of direct control exercised in the political sphere under colonialism, indirect control becomes the norm. This emerges from the very trajectory, the origins and evolution of neocolonialism. Principally, it did not come from the internal economic dynamism of imperialism. Rather, it was a political response, something forced on it by the tide of anti-colonial and national liberation struggles. In countries like China, this high tide was expressed as a revolution challenging the imperialist order. For imperialism, the success of the new global architecture hinged on the degree to which the tide of revolt could be turned back. The semblance of independence in former colonies thus became crucial for the emerging neo-colonial world order. The imperialist powers had to concede this, even if grudgingly. Even then, they tried to retain their direct control in the economic sphere. This was true of the U.S. too, which was promoting decolonization as a strategium to weaken major colonial powers like Britain and France. Wherever possible, imperialism tried to prevent any development that would weaken its direct economic grip. It sought to retain existing forms of exploitation and plunder of oppressed nations. This impacted the interests of the new rulers and the neo-colonies. They were keen on building and strengthening their own base in order to be in a better position to bargain. This tug of interest inevitably became a prominent aspect of the relations between imperialist powers and third world ruling classes. The shift to indirect control of the economies of semi-feudal, semi-colonial countries under neocolonialism took place over time. Primarily, it was enabled by the perfection of a new means for imperialist penetration, such as tied aid, transfer of obsolete technology, and conditional loans from imperialist agencies during periods of crisis. The new ruling classes remained subservient to imperialism as a whole, yet the legitimacy of their rule, their ideological hegemony, ultimately rested on the claim of heading an independent country. Wherever the communists or other revolutionary forces succeeded in gaining leadership of the struggle against the colonial power, they took it forward as a broad anti-imperialist, anti-feudal struggle. This forced the compradors and feudal classes in those countries to increasingly reveal their true nature as servitors of imperialism. In situations where revolutionary forces failed to gain leadership and power was transferred to the exploiting classes, they presented themselves as champions of independence. Having cornered the leadership of the struggle during the colonial period, they could conceal their nature and appear as genuine leaders of a quest to consolidate independence and achieve development. This appeared as a continuation of their leading role in the anti-colonial struggle. The bolstering and perfecting of the semblance of independence in both the political and economic realms was vital for the new ruling classes. The backing away of imperialism from retaining direct control over neo-colonial economies and the fleshing out of neo-colonialism was however mainly realized as responses to struggles of the masses, 
that is, through the working out of the contradiction between imperialism and oppressed nations and people. Though the contradictions between third world ruling classes and imperialist powers also had a role in this, it was secondary. These remained essentially non-antagonistic within the imperialist system. The opposition expressed by any third world state was always with one or the other imperialist power or bloc. It was never against the imperialist system as such. The limits of anti-colonial struggle, a struggle that had equated independence to the ending of colonial rule, was thus revealed. For the comprador and feudal classes, that limit was inherent in their class character. But for the classes that rallied under the leadership and thus failed to go beyond anti-colonialism, it was an unconscious internalization of comprador thought. It was also a process through which they were co-opted into the hegemonic consensus being forged by the rulers to be. They remained trapped in a false consciousness that presented dependence as independence. Those lacking in a consistent anti-imperialist stand inevitably failed to break away from imperialist thinking. That frame of thought and the policies it generated appeared to them as value-free universal principles. Imperialism's active role in shaping and influencing the academic world of neo-colonies complemented and strengthened the disguised subservience it spawned. Hence, for the neo-colonial mind, measures of imperialist control and exploitation are never seen as external impositions. They are considered as arising from the internal dynamics of the country, necessitated by its development quest. The neo-colonial mind is blind to the imperialist system in which the country is enmeshed. With their vision blocked from seeing the real world by the false consciousness of independence and its articulation as narrow nationalism, the neo-colonial intellectual-slash-technocrat proposes and pursues policies that heighten imperialism's grip ever more, all the while believing that they will strengthen the country. Participation in neo-colonial bodies like the IMF, WB, G20, and so on is seen as a matter of self-willed choice and recognition of one country's standing. It is not the case that the neo-colonial subjects have no contradiction with imperialism. We earlier saw the differentiation within this. There is the antagonistic contradiction the oppressed people have with the imperialist system, and there are also the non-antagonistic contradictions third world ruling classes have with this or that imperialist power. Consequently, the manner in which these contradictions are grasped varies. For the ruling classes, bred and shaped by imperialism, this is a matter of bargaining. That is not how it is experienced by other classes such as the national bourgeoisie, middle class, peasantry, and workers. Yet, to the extent they are under the sway of ruling class hegemonic consensus, the neo-colonial mind dominates. Apparent similarity is seen between their understanding of the country's position in the world, world events, and that of the ruling classes. The difference lies in their patriotism as opposed to the compradorism of the rulers. However, that patriotism fails in its subjective desire to be independent when it remains trapped in the neo-colonial frame of thought. In the final analysis, it ends up strengthening the ruling class's hegemonic consensus and dependence on the imperialist system. This is true even when it is expressed in the form of militant nationalism. An instance of this dynamism that readily comes to mind is the Indira Gandhi's government standoff with the U.S. in 1971 on the Bangladesh issue. Despite facing threatening moves by the U.S., the Indian government stuck to its plan to intervene in the Bangladesh Liberation War and ensure the breakup of Pakistan. The ruling classes celebrated it as proof of India's independent foreign policy and standing in the world. This stance in India's victory in the 1971 war were hailed by the broad masses with great fervor. In the midst of this, what went notice was the backing given by the erstwhile Soviet social imperialism as its tightening grip through the Indo-Soviet treaty. Thus, the patriotism of the masses became a means of legitimizing greater subservience to social imperialism and, through it, to the imperialist system as a whole. Having noted some of the salient features of the neo-colonial mind, we shall now return to the matter of the 1991 policy shift. The occasion of the 25th anniversary has been used by some intellectuals to grieve the years, quote, lost, unquote, preceding that shift. A rather simplistic lesson is drawn by comparing the rapid growth of Southeast Asian countries in that period with the slow pace seen in India. It is argued that these countries, quote, succeeded, unquote, because they had opened up to foreign capital quite early and boosted exports. India, on the contrary, remained a closed economy insisting on import substitution. Note that the position of these countries in the post-World War II political and economic architecture of the imperialist system simply does not figure in this argument. When that is taken into consideration, the key role played by the strategic moves of the U.S. in their growth would stand out. The importance given by the U.S. to these countries was closely related to its strategy of containing the impact of socialist China and growing national liberation struggles. The Vietnam War, pitting a communist-led people's war against the U.S. and allies, soon turned into a focal point. 
Countries like Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, Taiwan, and South Korea became even more important for the U.S. This was the global context enabling and shaping the economies of these countries through export-led growth. Yet, for all that, they remain links in the imperialist value commodity chain as component suppliers to transnational corporates. In recent decades, a few monopolies from these countries have emerged as significant players in consumer goods production. But then, so too have Indian corporates. Besides, import substitution was by no means unique to India. In its heyday, it was standard policy in a number of third world countries, particularly the bigger ones. Their common inspiration was a neo-colonial development model then favored by some imperialist circles. It was seen as a means to deepen imperialist penetration through project-tied loans and limited export of obsolete technology. Whether export-led or import-substituted, they ultimately contributed to a strengthening of dependence. The Indian neo-colonial mind is bitter about having been denied the opportunity to indulge in consumerist orgies along with its fellows in Southeast Asian countries. In doing so, it blinds itself to the hollowness of those economies, sharply exposed in the crisis that hit them in the late 1990s. Big corporates like Daewoo simply collapsed. A huge chunk of locally owned industrial assets was snatched up for a trifle by imperialist corporates. Their dependence on imperialism stood out in all its ugliness. Incidentally, the Indian economy escaped the worst of the 2007 global financial crisis precisely because it had not yet opened up to full capital convertibility. This was something the IMF and local technocrats had insistently demanded. But just around the time the clamor to fully open up capital markets reached a high pitch, the Southeast Asian, quote, tigers, unquote, started collapsing. Given their openness, they were unable to control capital flight. It was this turn, rather than the prudence of this or that RBI governor, that delayed full capital convertibility. And that turned out to be quite beneficial when the 2007 crisis hit the world. The neocolonial mind is still stuck in a time warp, lamenting the slow pace of opening up. An influential and growing section in imperialist ruling circles and its agencies have moved on. Full capital convertibility is seen by them as a major risk. It is no longer advised. The sharp rise in inequality following the implementation of GPL policies is recognized as a serious destabilizing factor. The neoliberal policy set is being amended. A trend arguing for this had emerged by the late 1990s and early 2000s, which calls for, quote, globalization with a human face, unquote, and, quote, inclusive government, unquote. What is significant is the broader respectability this has gained over the years in the IMF, WB, officialdom, and its promotion through their official journals. Even then, the main thrust of the neoliberal agenda still retains its venomous bite. Conditions imposed on Greece for a bailout loan are a sharp reminder. The slowdown of reforms during the UPA rule and attempts to revive it under the NDA too has been a prominent theme in neo-colonial academic political circles. There certainly was a slowdown. Objective factors underlay it. By the late 1990s and early years of 2000s, broad mass struggles broke out in many parts of the country. They were mainly focused on the forced displacement of peasants and Adivasis from their lands for the sake of multinational Indian corporate projects and special economic zones. The ruling classes had to take this into account, particularly because they aided the growth and spread of the Maoist movement in some regions. Taking a cue from imperialist circles, and lessons from the miserable defeat of the NDA-1 in 2004, the UPA started parroting globalization with a human face. It initiated reformist programs like MNREGA and adopted new acts meant to blunt struggles from below. The aggressive promotion of GPL was held back to some extent. The neocolonial mind grasps this as its own product. The conclusion that India is not suited to the application of the Washington Consensus is presented as original thought emerging from Indian reality. Imperialist finance capital is renamed by some as global capital. Defying all indicators of deepening dependency, it is even claimed that global capitalism has been created within India. It is not that those who state such views are unaware of policy rethinking taking place in imperialist circles. They consider this merely an enabling factor. The real impetus, in their view, comes from internal developments. Imperialist agencies certainly do not produce policies purely from their own thought or conditions. Political, social, and economic developments in third world countries are under their constant observation. Sensing the mood of the broad masses is an important part of this. Comprador rulers and intellectuals are vital sources in this process. There is continuous interaction with them. But ultimately, policy is set at the global level by imperialist think tanks and agencies serving finance capital. The comprador, the neocolonial mind, won't experience this as an external input. 
After all, they too have been part of its evolution, yet they are still not the deciding factor for the formulation of policy, however incomprehensible it is to the neocolonial mind. Let us go back to the slowdown revival theme posed and debated in neocolonial circles. One notes a near total absence of any reference to the 2007 global crisis and the long drawn out global recession it caused. If we are to really understand what happened and is happening in our economy, this must be factored in. In the initial years of the crisis, China and India, and a few other third world countries, were able to maintain their growth and remain stable. Restrictions on capital convertibility played a major role in this. The relative stability of these economies was an important factor aiding the imperialist powers to write out the worst years of the crisis. However, given the enmeshing of these economies in the imperialist system, this could not be sustained for long. By 2010-11, the continuing recession in imperialist countries started impacting them. Furthermore, the UPA too got caught up in the uncertainties of its coalition politics. A stable government that could vigorously push the GPL agenda became a pressing necessity. This underlay the all-out backing given to Modi and the BJP-led NDA by the ruling classes and imperialists. The payback is now appearing as a stepped-up effort to carry out GPL. It is not just a matter of economic policies. Concerted efforts to stifle democratic protests through deploying the fascist hordes of the Song Paravar, the attempt to disarm the masses by fanning up narrow nationalism and a massive increase in paramilitary deployment in areas of struggle, are all part of this step-up. Despite all this and the haste to attract foreign capital, growth rates have kept on falling. Banking is in a mess. Fresh local investment is stagnant. Demonetization and GST have further worsened things. The biggest chunk of India's industry is in the unorganized medium, small, and tiny sectors. They are suffering the most, along with the rural economy. The Modi government seeks the answer in a more desperate effort to attract foreign capital. Every instance of foreign capital coming in, even if it is mainly portfolio investment in the share, debt markets, is hailed as proof of the Indian economy's strength and confidence in the present ruling dispensation. Finance capital is flowing in, no doubt. It seeks profits from differences in interest rates by borrowing at low or zero rates in imperialist countries and investing it here to take advantage of the higher rates existing in India. The recession in imperialist countries also leads finance capital to seize profitable investment opportunities in countries like India that still retain some buoyancy. Thus, a few sectors like urban transportation have seen fresh foreign investment. We can see this in the race for the metro networks, even in the cities, that still do not have proper roads. Huge amounts of finance capital, in the form of loans, are flowing into fund these projects. They give recession-stricken rail industries in imperialist countries some reprieve. The Smart Cities Project is another example of opening up new avenues for profit-seeking finance capital. It is predicated on a wholesale privatization of municipal services. Control over finance capital is the key lever in the global imperialist system. According to a study by a research group in Switzerland, just 20 imperialist transnational financial corporates control almost all the big corporates in the world. No matter how many companies in the Tatas or Ambanas buy up in imperialist countries, even if more than half of their income originates in global operations, they remain comprador midgets before these giants. The composition of India's relatively higher growth rate is itself reflective of the country's true status. It is mainly consumption-driven. Industrial production does not contribute even one-third. Ramadas Rupavath has plainly gotten his facts wrong. Let alone, quote, carving niches, unquote, India's performance in the global marketplace is still quite negligible. But, more than the factual error, what is most worrying is the shocking knowledge that even someone like Rupavath, who stands with the oppressed, is trapped in the discourse of the neocolonial mind. We are forcefully reminded that an unapologetic, aggressive anti-imperialism is by no means outdated. We need more of it in higher doses. If not reservation, then what? The last two decades have seen many a struggle of Sarbana youth in various states demanding reservation. They stand in sharp contrast to the anti-reservation agitations of the 1980s and 1990s. The main force and leading sections of those movements were the very same castes now demanding reservation. Then they were demanding the scrapping of caste-based reservation and its replacement with economic criteria. They insisted that prominence should be given to merit. Currently, the demand is for inclusion in the reservation list as caste. They are adamant on this, even if it calls for amending the 50% cutoff imposed by the Supreme Court. The anti-reservation agitations were mostly urban-centered. Today, they are predominantly rural-based. 
how should we understand this total reversal of demands and shift of locus? What do its dynamics reveal? Quite a few have commented on this. The gist of their reasoning is as follows. The plateauing of the Green Revolution and falling growth rates in agriculture form the backdrop. This was the underlying current of the 1980s agitations as well. But in that period, the predominant impulse was that given by stagnant job opportunities. The initial stirring up that came with the globalization, privatization, liberalization, GPL agenda in the 1990s, and growth in urban and rural employment markets have provided some relief. Soon enough, this proved to be superficial. The promises of the GPL agenda turned out to be hollow. While government statistics faithfully recorded growth year after year, it added very few new jobs. Even these were mainly low-paid and casual, mostly in the unorganized sector. According to a 2014 Comptroller and Auditor General CAG report, data on 117 special economic zones showed a whopping 93% gap between actual employment generated by them and the projections made at the time of their getting approval. Earlier, higher education was a largely reliable route to regular jobs and income. Rapid growth of private educational institutions and new courses led to a boom in educational opportunities. Several new careers have come up but extremely high fees put them out of reach of the vast majority. All of these factors are greatly restricting avenues for the upward mobility of Savarna youth. Rural Savarna youth suffer the most. This makes reservation and its assurance of education and employment so important for them. While all of these are valid, they still remain restricted to proximate reasons. There is something more fundamental going on here. These agitations have mainly taken place in regions that saw good growth through the Green Revolution. Their agriculture is supposed to have become capitalist, yet caste being employed as the identifier for mobilization, the demand for reservation being made as caste, indicates something else. The very nature of the transformations that have taken place need probing. What has changed, what remains unchanged in the rural economy, and why? How do they relate to the current agitations of the Savarna youth? Let us first go through some data. The share of the agricultural sector in the GDP has been steadily going down, it was 18.2% in 2013 and 14. Between 1999 and 2000, and 2011 through 2012, employment in agriculture dropped from 23.83 crores to 23.13 crores. This sector is the only one that suffered negative growth in employment during this period. The rural sector as a whole still contributes 48% to the GDP, but by the first two decades of liberalization, its asset-to-population share ratio has decreased by nearly one-third as compared to an almost equal increase in the urban sector. Survey reports indicate that the major chunk of credit availed in rural areas is used for household needs. When coupled with the data on asset imbalance, this reveals a fall in rural capital formation. The bottom of strata of agrarian classes subsist on a combination of agricultural and non-agricultural wage labor and livestock rearing. This has been and remains the norm, rather than the typical capitalist trend where members of this class increasingly get transformed into industrial labor. Along with this, the shifting of people from agriculture is steadily increasing over the generations. Interestingly, this too is modulated by caste. A difference of more than 10 percentage points was seen between Brahmins and Dalits in this regard in UP. Despite all of this, cultivation remains the principal source of income for those with land holdings above one acre, and its share increases in proportion to land size. Decreasing returns on top of its risky nature make agriculture an unprofitable venture. Correspondingly, the social value of even large holdings and sizable agricultural operations has also been steadily depreciating. The social downgrading of agriculture is well indicated by contemporary trends in the marriage market. Until a few decades ago, substantial land holdings had premium value. Nowadays, preference is given to grooms who have regular, non-agricultural jobs in a city. The quote, loss of face, unquote, of youth who are forced to return to their villages in the event of failing to gain decent employment in urban centers is yet another social indicator of the depreciation of the rural sector. Non-farm jobs and migration have increased quite significantly. A Green Revolution, or GR, region in western UP reported in 1974-75 through 75 that 70% of its jobs were in the farm sector. By 2008-9, through non-farm jobs accounted for 60%. The same is seen all over the country. Growth in non-farm jobs now outstrips that of those in the agricultural sector. The non-farm workforce went up to 38% in 2011-12 through 12 from 1922 and 1993. Most of these jobs are low-paid and casual, mainly in construction and services. Proximity to urban centers increases their availability. Where most male workers go to urban centers for work, 
agricultural operations are mostly becoming a female occupation. The growth of non-farm jobs in both urban and semi-urban centers has led to seasonal labor scarcity in villages and an across-the-board rise in rural wages. There has been a steady growth in census towns, or CT, accelerating between 2001 and 2011. They accounted for nearly 80% of the urban population growth during this period. Any village reporting 4,000 plus population, 400 per square kilometer population density, and with more than 75% main male workers, and non-farm work in a census round is declared a CT in the next round. Though considered part of the urban, there is actually not much to distinguish a CT in the nature and quality of its infrastructure from the rural surrounding it. A Bihar study indicated social dynamics of caste, community, and gender almost identical to the rural. Establishments in the CT were mostly of a subsistence type, with scant potential for capital accumulation. It was observed that the only trade seen flourishing was that of private, informal money lending. Out-of-state migration is, in some states, a major source of income for the bottom-most section of society. In Bihar, more than half the income of households reporting migration came from remittances. While most of the migrant workers from Savarna and higher intermediate caste, OBC, are engaged in permanent salary jobs, the rest are mainly into casual work. Migration for work now counts in the crores. To give some idea, in migration for Kuralam alone was 2,350,000 per annum in 2013. Rough estimates put the total migrant labor present in the state at 30 lakhs, i.e. nearly one-tenth of its population. For the country as a whole, internal migration is estimated to have shot up by nearly 25% during 2007-2008 through 2011. Increased non-farm employment and migration with concomitant higher local wages, have pushed up household income at the bottommost levels of rural society. It has not, however, led to any immediate gain in productive assets. Most of the extra income is used for educating children and improving or constructing houses. Despite the greater importance given to education across all classes, its utility has been much restricted by shrinking employment prospects. While 7 lakhs new jobs were added in 2011 and 12, it fell to 1.5 lakhs in 2014 and 15. Taking a longer span of time, six crores jobs were created during 1999 through 2004. This decreased by nearly two-thirds to 2.7 crores during 2004 through 2010. The GPL's jobless growth agenda is starkly seen in these figures. Employment elasticity, growth in jobs for every point rise in GDP, has steadily gone down to 0.15 in 2016, from 0.39 in 1999 through 2000. Even sectors like the software industry that have accounted for a higher and growing share of permanent employment are affected by jobless growth. An estimate indicates that the number of employees needed to generate 6,300 crores at 2017 rates, roughly $1 billion revenue, in this sector has fallen by half in the last six years. Government and public sector employment also show a noticeable fall in numbers. At present, 44% of government jobs are temporary. The growing trend of automation promises an even more dismal scene in the years to come. Access to education, employment, and political positions have led to the emergence of tiny elites among the intermediate castes, Dalits, and in some states, Adivasis. Utilizing these opportunities, they have been able to improve their economic status. These strata are now buying up land and other assets. They are present in the local, state, central, political, and administrative setup. To that extent, the means of domination and ascension are no longer exclusively in the hands of Savarna village elites. Thus, while Savarna domination still remains decisive in an overall sense, some sections of the oppressed caste have been able to take advantage of new opportunities. Their historically given position in the traditional caste order has played a crucial role in this. For most of the oppressed caste, local or migrant subsistence non-farm employment is often accompanied by low-scale livestock rearing it contributed almost one-fourth to their household income. At the opposite end, for the landlords, rich peasants, and a tiny section of middle peasants from the oppressor caste, diversification has led to their entry into profitable avenues like commission agencies, trade and agricultural inputs, real estate agencies, and small or medium entrepreneurship. By virtue of their socioeconomic positions and political clout, they corner almost all government subsidies and gain the most from government schemes. They are well entrenched at all levels of the local administration. Caste or religious community networks spanning the whole state, closely intertwined with political affiliations, greatly enable them. 
their ability to exert local domination is directly related to the links that they have with the state apparatus through such networks. Control over local administrative bodies and cooperative societies helps them in strengthening and sustaining patronage webs in the villages. Violence carried out with the silent support or even connivance of the local police is employed to put down any challenge. A minuscule portion from among them has even succeeded in joining the ranks of the big bourgeoisie by depending on Largus, garnered through political slash governmental connections. As noted earlier, peasants from the higher echelons of the intermediate caste are purchasing land. Most of it comes from upper castes selling off portions of their land to meet economic or social demands, such as marriage expenses. The upper strata of the intermediate castes have been quite active in adopting new technology. They even surpass Savarna caste in this regard. Their socioeconomic elevation has also led to a greater degree of Brahmanization among them. Quite often, they now appear as the direct oppressors of Dalits. With growing class differentiation, the cleavage among intermediate castes formerly acknowledged in the creation of a most backward class category has also become explicit. Caste still determines the capability of different sections in moving into better paid and high status jobs, but regardless of caste, for the vast majority, the trend has been one of impoverishment. A growing section of peasantry from Savarna and intermediate caste has been pushed down to the ranks of marginal peasantry and agricultural labor. Large numbers of regular workers from these castes employed in big industry have been thrown out of regular jobs and reduced to casual workers as part of a downsizing the labor force, an integral part of the GPL agenda. Meanwhile, Dalits, Adivasis, and oppressed castes among religious minorities continue to form the bulk of the bottommost levels. Caste relations are not as of old. Dalits are now able to lease in land on various terms of tenancy. Though forced to part with a large share of surplus, tenancy gives them a chance to improve their economic situation, subject to the fluctuating fortunes of agriculture. Fixed money rent is nowadays more common. Paying rent as a fixed share of surplus in cash or produce also remains significant, amounting to 40% of all lease terms. Another indication of changing caste structures is seen in the pattern of dwellings. Mixed caste neighborhoods, particularly with Dalits residing as neighbors of Savarna or intermediate castes, are still extremely rare in rural areas. However, they do exist now. This was something unthinkable a few decades ago. Landlessness or land poverty of the great majority at one end and monopolization of land by a tiny minority at the other remains predominant. Taking one acre as the minimum land size to generate some income, it is estimated that there has been a 6% point increase in effective landlessness in just 10 years, 2002 through 3 to 2012 through 13, and it has now reached 66.1%. While this figure is already quite alarming, it still doesn't capture the full dimensions of the matter. A one-acre cutoff would be totally inadequate for any meaningful farming in dry areas, which comprises most of the cultivable land. Even in irrigated areas with double cropping, the produce of one acre would hardly suffice for a minimum standard of living. Hence, we can safely conclude that effective landlessness is far more than the estimate seen above. Though the weight of land ownership in defining economic and social status has depreciated, land still remains a prized asset. Access to this resource is still mainly determined by caste. This is equally true of, quote, advanced, unquote, states like Punjab or Kuralam, and, quote, backward, unquote, ones like Bihar. An NSSO survey reports that 55% of land is controlled by 10% Savarnas. To quote from a Madhya Pradesh village study, quote, on an average, upper and dominant castes appear as those still holding the bulk of Jamgod's land. Land is no longer the most important asset against which political and social life is structured. However, to understand who owns land and why remains central to understanding the operation of power in the village. We can see the enduring nature of caste inequality in relation to resources, occupations, migration, and land fragmentation, unquote. So what is to be made of all this? The rural scene has no doubt changed. Yet the nature of this is such that in all spheres, political, economic, social, and cultural, many of the previously existing relations have been reproduced and reinforced in new ways and forms. This precisely is its uniqueness. Properly understood, it will provide an initial basis for grasping the strange phenomena of those lauded as, quote, progressive, unquote, farmers, demanding reservation on a caste basis, reversing their earlier anti-reservation stance. It is not the case that they are returning to caste. No, that has been a crucial aspect of their social, economic, cultural, and political lives all along. Their earlier opposition to caste-based reservation was just as much casteist as is their present demand. 
An All India evaluation of data obtained from a 2013 NSSO survey on agricultural households reveals how land ownership, tenancy conditions, agricultural infrastructure, credit sources, and burden, and productivity still vary across caste quite significantly. The persistence of caste, its reproduction and reinforcement, is of course all too visible in the all around, continuing deprivation of Dalits and other oppressed social sections, as well as in the privileges, resources, and positions enjoyed by the oppressor caste. Given that caste was intrinsic to pre capitalist production relations existing in South Asia, this raises questions about the capitalism that is said to have replaced them. Rather than classical capitalism that grew by eliminating feudalism in one way or the other way, the one engendered here by colonialism has forever been intertwined with caste feudalism. It has always served both imperialism and feudalism. Mao Zedong named it bureaucratic capitalism, indicating the close association of this capitalism with the state. This goes beyond the usual relation of a class with its state, i.e. the overall securing of its class interests through the state machinery. In bureaucrat capitalism, the state has a direct role in the growth or decline of different sections of the big bourgeoisie. Their fortunes wax and wane in direct proportion to their proximity to the current political center of power. In recent years, the term crony capitalism has been coined by some to describe the nexus between political players and corporates, and the role of political patronage in business prospects. It is a misnomer. Reducing the matter to one of personal preferences and inclinations, it avoids grappling with the structural role of this relation. In oppressed countries, the state is both a facilitator and site of capital accumulation. In many of these countries, government-owned companies, financial institutions, and savings aggregators like insurance companies and large trading concerns exist along with private bureaucrat capital. Even while pursuing their specific interests and having non-antagonistic contradictions with each other, the public and private complement each other. They form two factions of a single class, the comprador bureaucrat bourgeoisie. The borderline between these factions is by no means rigid. Political leaders, members of the higher bureaucracy, upper echelons of the armed forces, and others from the top levels of the state machinery amass wealth by appropriating public funds or getting bribes for favoring one or the other foreign or local corporate. Employing this as capital through close relatives, or proxies, they themselves become comprador or corporates. In recent years, owners of big private concerns have directly joined the political class as parliament members or ministers. The roots of this class lie among trading agents and employees of imperialist concerns, and later of the colonial state, gradually coalescing into a class that has steadily progressed in the industry and finance. Lately, prominent private and state-owned monopolies of this class are getting even more integrated with the world imperialist system by setting up industrial units in imperialist countries or buying up existing firms. Some of them get more than half of their total profits from overseas operations. Apparently, this seems to indicate that they've become capable of standing on an equal footing with imperialist transnational corporations. In actuality, these compradors are only stepping into businesses vacated by imperialist finance capital for various reasons, a pattern seen from colonial times. Along with its subservience to imperialism, i.e. its compradorism, caste feudal values and relations have a living presence in the existence and operations of this class. It is, even today, predominantly composed of savarnas. Its functioning is highly dependent on caste networks, now spanning the state machinery and the political elite. These networks today have more of a savarna nature, rather than being caste-specific. Yet the latter also continues. Brahmanism is an intrinsic part of its ideological outlook. The fortunes of bureaucrat capitalism are directly related to impulses from imperialism and mediated through the active role of the state. This is equally true of its emergence and spread in the rural sector. The bourgeois state has always played an active role in the capitalist transformation of feudalism. England's enclosure laws were an example. But the role of the state in promoting bureaucrat capitalism in the agrarian sector of an oppressed country is qualitatively different. In the former case, the state's role was limited to creating favorable conditions through regulations and laws for the growth of agrarian capitalism. In the latter, the colonial state directly implanted and grew bureaucrat capitalist relations, transforming feudalism into semi-feudalism. The neo-colonial state continues to play this role through direct and indirect means. The canal systems built by the British Raj in pre-partition West Punjab and in the Godavari Krishna deltas were of this nature. Increased productivity led to greater class differentiation of the peasantry and the growth and strengthening of the rich peasantry along with landlords. They received a further push through the Green Revolution. State intervention was not limited to infrastructural development. 
It encompassed inputs as well as capital, advanced as credit, to enable implementation of this package. In some cases, minimal land reforms were also carried out. What is notable about these developments is the secondary role of internal agency. Its impetus was and continues to be overwhelmingly external, not only from outside the rural sector, but more essentially from outside the country. Quite naturally, though, the rural classes that benefited the most, even entrepreneurs who have emerged, are of a hybrid type. Their existence is bound up with the bureaucrat capitalism and imperialism through heavy dependence on them for finances, resources, and markets. It is also tied up with persisting caste feudal relations and values. This is seen in their economic activities, whether in agriculture, industry, or services. Caste and Brahmanism remain key media of their sustenance and reproduction, such as the inevitable outcome of the growth of bureaucrat capitalism. The emergence and development of capitalism, whether through a radical revolution or gradual evolution, was always accompanied by a fundamental and comprehensive transformation of existent value systems, culture, and social norms of the whole ideological realm. Unlike this, the persisting living presence of the old and the new distinguishes bureaucrat capitalism. This is not a matter of comparing it with some generic type and identifying where it lacks. Western capitalism's claim to be the, quote, universal model, unquote, rightly stands debunked today. But that does not mean that the distinguishing features of bureaucrat capitalism can be reduced to the inevitable uniqueness of every particular process of historical evolution. The fact that those features are common to all oppressed countries, even if modulated by country-specific features, drives in the point that there is something more. This is capitalism of a different type. Understanding bureaucrat capitalism helps us to situate the apparently perplexing reversal of, quote, anti-revisionist, unquote, Sarvarna caste into staunch supporters of caste-based reservation. It explains why caste remains a key form of social existence and mobilization. Noticeably, while the agitations of the 1980s and 90s were of Savarna caste and bloc, now it is a matter of specific caste demands as Jots, Marathas, Patels, etc. Bureaucrat capitalism also explains the steady growth of class differentiation within these castes, which too has a compelling presence in the social dynamics underlying these movements. Subservience to imperialism in conjunction with semi-feudalism are intrinsic to bureaucrat capitalism. Altogether, they impose shackles on the economy and block sustainable, all-around growth. Scarce non-farm employment opportunities, both rural and urban, are a consequence now aggravated by the GPL. The situation of the Marathas and Maharashtra is illustrative. Averaging nearly 40% of the state's population, they are far better placed than other castes, politically, socially, and economically. More than half of the members of Legislative Assembly, MLA, in Maharashtras are Maraths. Most educational institutes are owned by the elite of this caste. They are chairpersons of the most cooperative banks and sugar factories. Meanwhile, in the midst of this prosperity, an increasing number of Maraths are joining the ranks of the economically deprived. While the proportion of landless is quite low and those owning above five acres is quite high among them, this is not the case in other sized classes. In the middle sized classes, their share is more or less the same as that of the intermediate castes, OBCs, though better endowed in terms of infrastructure. Their educational attainments, too, are not any better. A recent survey carried out by the government of Maharashtra recorded a large number of Marathas employed in casual labor across a wide spectrum of low-paying occupations. These included works considered as, quote, socially degrading, unquote, in caste terms. Similar class divisions exist in the Jats, the dominant caste of Haranya. According to the Second Indian Human Development Survey, 2011-12, through 12, the annual per capita mean income, APMI, of the Harana Jats is much higher than the state average. This rosy picture, however, vanishes when incomes are disaggregated by quintiles. The top quintiles corner 62.5% of the caste total income, leaving just 4% to the bottom most one. The latter's APMI of 11,191 rupees is just half the average income of Dalits. 67% of Jats depend on agriculture as their main source of income. Only 2.5% have government jobs. When the data is coupled with the fact that a business person's income was nearly six times more than that of a farmer, one can well understand the multiple dimensions of the sense of deprivation growing among this otherwise dominant caste. Evidently, class differentiation is playing a key role in the demands of these castes for reservation. A combination and intertwining of class and caste dynamics is seen here. It cannot be wholly explained by the usual class polarization caused by capitalist growth. Neither can it be understood by simply referring to the continuation of social division associated with caste feudalism. Both of them are drawn into this unique combination by bureaucrat capitalism. Can the demand of the Savarna youth for educational and employment opportunities propelled by class and caste impulses be satisfied through reservation? 
we can start answering this by taking a look at its dimensions, the available supply and the demand building up. After excluding currently reserved opportunities, those available for additional reservation would be quite limited. Going by newspaper reports, it would come to 7,500 jobs, according to the Chief Minister of Maharashtra. This figure gives a rough idea of the impossibility of satisfying the demands of locks of Maratha youth through reservation. One sees the same gigantic mismatch between the demands of youth, irrespective of caste, all over the country and the existing potential for satisfying them. The opportunities are simply not there. Media reports about locks of applicants turning up for job vacancies numbering a few hundred, of doctorates and postgraduates queuing up for Class D posts, repeatedly drive home this harsh fact. Reservation will hardly make a dent in the employment situation of Sarvana youth. Given their higher cultural and social endowments, their demand is all the more voluminous. While not being even a partial solution, extending reservation to the Savarnas also contains the danger of overturning caste-based reservation itself. Growing impoverishment or economic stagnation among them is indisputable. Nevertheless, compared to the oppressed caste, they still remain better endowed in all senses. In particular, they continue to be dominant. Social relations that reproduce this domination continue to be an integral aspect of the hurdles of the Dalits, Adivasis, intermediate castes, and oppressed castes among religious minorities must surmount to gain education, regular employment, and a life of dignity. Caste-based reservation hence continues to be a vital necessity for these social groups. Extending it to Saranas would mean equating their situation to that of the socially oppressed sections and concealing their dominant position. It would thus contribute to a strengthening of that position and the consequent oppression suffered by the dominated social groups. Given the growing class differentiation and economic deprivation among Sarvana castes, reservation for the economically deprived among them is being proposed by some as a solution. This may seem to be quite progressive. However, since it still allows reservation for these sections on the basis of caste, it contains the retrogressive content of placing the oppressors on the same plane as the oppressed. Grounds would be prepared to eliminate caste criteria for reservation and replace them with economic ones. Not just deprivation, prosperity too is mediated through caste. A Dalit millionaire, or a highly placed Dalit official, still faces caste discrimination. One cannot therefore simply single out the economic deprivation seen among Sarvanas, ignoring the privileges and dominance they retain. That is not to say that deprivation suffered by any section of society need not be considered if they happen to be Sarvana. Not just economic ones, every disadvantage of gender, different abilities, regional backwardness, etc., must be given due weight and preference in providing educational and employment opportunities. If this principle is applied rigorously in the filling up of unreserved or open seats and job opportunities, the disadvantages suffered by the less privileged among Savarnas would be addressed without affecting caste-based reservation. The same principle should also be applied within the reserved category. That would secure the interests of the more deprived among oppressed castes and check the growing monopolization of reservation opportunities by the better off among them. It needs to be emphasized that what is proposed here is totally different from the quote, creamy layer, unquote, principle imposed by the Supreme Court. As noted earlier, even the economically well-endowed among the oppressed castes and Adivasi still face discrimination. That is, in itself, sufficient reason for ensuring their reservation rights, regardless of income levels. Sociological experiments have conclusively exposed the bias they face. In one such experiment, Sarvana candidates were seen to be greatly preferred compared to overqualified ones from Dalit castes. Such biases remain as hurdles throughout the careers of employees from the oppressed sections of society, making reservations and promotions also a vital need. Agreeing that the demand of Sarvarna youth for reservation is just, while pleading inability to grant it because of the 50% ceiling imposed by the courts, the ruling classes are playing a double game. Though this cutoff was imposed by the judiciary, almost all sections of the ruling classes have supported and promoted it, some silently. They saw it as a tool to circumvent the Mandal Commission recommendations and limit reservation opportunities of the intermediate castes. This cutoff has no logic to support it other than the designs of Sarvarna elite to retain their monopoly at all levels of the state structure, including its ideological apparatus. It should be scrapped. Dalits, Adivasis, intermediate castes, and oppressed castes among religious minorities should enjoy reservation rights proportionate to their share of population. Given that the great majority of educational and employment opportunities are now in the private sector, it too should be brought under the ambit of caste-based reservation. Of course, all of these remedies will only be mere palliatives. Neither reservation nor any form of affirmative action is going to satisfy the demands of the youth, whichever caste they may come from. The present setup just does not permit this. Moreover, the current modes of jobless growth rules out any easing. We must seek out basic solutions elsewhere.
The Modi government has proposed a huge buildup of urban centers and a countrywide grid of industrial corridors. It is expected that this will generate sufficient opportunities. Such plans are by no means novel, nor are they unique to the BJP-led NDA. In Kuralam, the earlier United Democratic Front, or UDF, government, led by the Congress and the present CPM, led Left Democratic Front, or LDF, one have already advanced similar projects. No doubt there is some common external source behind all three of them, which is worth probing. Let that be for now. Can large-scale urbanization be the solution? No. Most of the jobs it will deliver will be low-paid casual ones. Only a narrow minority will get steady, well-paid ones. Even the skewed benefit will be far outweighed by the opportunity cost of the disruption caused and rural livelihoods. That is attested to by each and every one of the new high-tech cities or extensions of existing cities that have come up during the past couple of decades. Apart from all of this, ecological concerns stand against such urban-centric growth models. The solution must address the urban sector too, but its locus has to be in agriculture and the broader rural sector, including semi-urban pockets within it. That is where the vast majority live. A sustainable solution has to address them. It must necessarily rupture from the existent, dominant growth model. The growth that has taken place in agriculture until now has mainly come through technical fixes. After this first flush of the green, white, etc. revolutions, returns have, on the average, steadily decreased since the 1980s. Ever since then, quote, off-farm, unquote, activities, integrated farming, where subsidiary occupations are paired with cultivation, and similar schemes have been propagated as solutions. They have been tried in many states. Results, however, have not been promising. The products of such subsidiary occupations have themselves suffered from price fluctuations. Nowadays, there is much discussion about the recommendations of the MS, Swaminathan Commission. One of them calls on the government to ensure a base price for agricultural produce that will give at least 50% profit to the peasants. This cannot be a permanent solution. No government will be able to offer prices above market rates for long. At times of abundant harvest, it will be forced to limit its purchases. The peasants will be pushed back to their earlier situation. Simply pushing capital and technology or giving higher prices will not suffice. The vast majority doesn't have the basic resources needed to fruitfully avail them. At the base, widespread landlessness or lack of land sufficient for even subsistence. At the top, huge land holdings of traditional or new landlords. Even in a state like Punjab, holdings in hundreds of acres are seen. A new trend of real estate corporates and governments building up large holdings as so-called, quote, land banks, unquote, is now common throughout the country. Meanwhile, 83% of the rural households hold less than 30% of the land. Among those who have resources, the very nature of bureaucratic capitalism favors the minority of landlords and wealthy farmers. Rather than building sustainable linkages, it goes to strengthen usury and predatory trading by commission agents. Bank and cooperative credit going to fund usury is well documented. The share of institutional credit is above 50% in most states. Yet the private money lenders remain the main source of credit for the bottom strata and even the middle ones. Not just money lenders, even the landlords and rich peasantry continue to be the main creditors of the poor and landless peasants. A field study done in Punjab as recently as 2015 noted that 67.8% of agricultural labor household debt was sourced from large farmers. The lowermost landowning size classes, marginal, small, and semi-medium, were mainly dependent on commission agents and money lenders. Atrocious interest rates imposed by the creditors put a heavy burden on the peasantry. A large number of peasant suicides reported from Maharashtra, currently the quote lead unquote state in the matter, have been caused by indebtedness to private money lenders. Informal credit inevitably reproduces and reinforces traditional ties of dependence or even bondage. While the returns of agriculture have either reduced or remained stagnant, the standard of living in rural society at large has gone up. New necessities like education, institutionalized medical treatment, and demand for various consumer durables like pressure cookers, fans, television sets, and mobile phones, etc. have emerged. A margin of return that would have been considered satisfactory some decades ago has now become quite insufficient to meet multiple needs, even for middle and rich peasants. The burden of new needs and the ever-increasing cost of agriculture have been major factors behind high and growing levels of rural indebtedness. During 2002 through 12, the share of debt used to meet household expenses went up from 47% to 60% of the total debt incurred in rural areas. Among Dalits and Adivasis, 92 and 95% of debt respectively go to meet household expenses. Altogether, a growing share of agrarian surplus and wage income is being used to service debt obligations. This reduces expendable income and promotes extreme measures like suicide. Agriculture's real potential is enchained by all of these relations. 
In order to unleash a tremendous surge in productivity and generate material conditions for developing a wide range of sustainable linkages, they must be eliminated. The vast majority must be endowed with resources, primarily land. Along with that, a wide range of local industrial units engaged in agro-processing, manufacture and repair of agricultural machinery, other industrial activities related to agriculture, livestock rearing, pisciculture, etc., as well as various services should be promoted. A good number of youth would be absorbed in them. The emergence of a vibrant rural economy would also draw back a large section that had migrated to urban centers in search of livelihood. The reforms proposed here cannot stand separate from a complete overhaul of society aimed at making it self-reliant and equitable. I have kept that aside in order to focus on the rural sector, since redistribution of resources, most importantly land, is the key. It has been argued that large agrarian holdings with a high level of mechanization and plantations must be exempted from such land reforms and retained under collective or state ownership. This misses the political, social, and cultural dimensions of land ownership, particularly in the context of caste oppression. Denial of land ownership to Dalits, and even access to it, was a cornerstone of the oppressive relations of caste feudalism. Persists is seen in high degree of landlessness among Dalits. Hence, enabling individual ownership through land redistribution is a must in laying the foundations for the annihilation of caste. Viewing the matter merely from the angle of economies of scale, collectivization or progress to social ownership would be economist. In the case of large holdings with integrated operations, productivity can be maintained by combining individual ownership with collective operations. On the other hand, the gaining of ownership of land by Dalit and other landless will smash centuries-old shackles of caste and economic discrimination. The leap in consciousness it will give rise to, if properly led, will unleash great productivity and lay a solid foundation for progress to collectivization. While the equitable redistribution of land remains key, we must also consider the undeniable and growing trend of moving away from agriculture. Most notably, this is seen precisely among those sections who most need land. Despite this need, the dire situation seen among those who already have land turns them away. 70% of farmer suicides have taken place among those holding 2.5 to 25 acres. There was a 40% increase in suicides during 2014 through 15, and most of them took place in regions where GM, genetically modified seeds, promoted as the next leap in agriculture, have been introduced on a large scale. The outlook for agriculture is indeed rather gloomy. It isn't surprising that large sections of even the landless peasantry don't consider ownership of land as a reliable means of livelihood. The trend of moving away from agriculture is most prominent among the youth. For Dalit youth, there is the additional impulse to move away from agriculture as part of escaping from traditional ties of subservience. Despite all of this, the land hunger of the landless remains strong. This is translated into persistently increasing shares of, quote, pure tenant, unquote, those without own land, in the total number of tenants. Objective conditions evidently restrict their options for moving out, whatever their subjective inclination may be. Moreover, not just as an economic asset, land ownership still remains decisive in the social domain. It is still central in describing and deciding social status and political hegemony. The reform of agriculture, boosting productivity, and enabling all-around growth is still crucial for satisfying the growing demands for jobs. So how can this gap between the subjective mood of turning away from agriculture and the objective reality of its still remaining key for meaningful advance be bridged? To attempt a solution, we must start by recognizing that the outlook of peasantry on agriculture and land is quite varied, region-wise. In backward areas and Adivasi regions, land continues to be primarily considered as a means of livelihood. In Adivasi regions, it has an additional dimension of being part of their identities, of their spiritual beliefs. Whereas in most other areas, the overwhelming outlook is that of seeing land as a commercial asset, even while it continues to be used for farming and related activities. Some studies on anti-displacement struggles have noted this difference. In the former areas, the predominant mood was fierce opposition to land alienation. In the latter, the resistance focused on getting just compensation and jobs. This suggests the need for varied tactics while taking up the land question. In regions where the attachment to land is predominantly agrarian, land to the real tillers will remain central to immediate mobilization. In other regions, even while retaining its centrality in a strategic sense, it will be of limited value as an immediate demand for mobilizing struggle. In these places, the struggle against the all-around domination, bondages of patronage, and the appropriation of public wealth carried out by old and newly emerged exploiters would be key in an immediate sense. They are mostly landlords, but not only so. 
Their hegemony is usually concretized through the nexus with local political leaders, government officials, and instruments of state power like the police. Quite often, they or their extended family members themselves occupy these positions. Apart from exploitation of economic surplus, illegal cornering and control of public wealth and resources become their principal means of amassing surplus many a time. Opposition is put down with their own armed gangs or through the state machinery. The local police itself functions as their executors. The struggles against the hegemony of these exploiters will bring about the real relations blocking the advance of the peasantry. It will also expose the central role of monopoly control by a minority over resources, including land, in sustaining these relations, and the need for radical reform to end it. Coupled with a broad vision of all-around transformation and the role agriculture and the rural sector must fulfill in order to provide it a solid foundation, this can thus provide the means to check and reverse the trend of moving away from agriculture. The ongoing agitations of Savarni youth for reservations open space for raising some penetrating questions. In the initial decades after the transfer of power in 1947, the rulers were assuring us of rapid industrialization through, quote, import substitution, unquote, and then later, quote, export-led growth, unquote. The Green Revolution was being heralded until the 1990s. Since then, all their talk is about GM seeds. Simultaneously, double-digit growth was promised through the GPL agenda. Why have all these promises failed? Why is it that a full 70 years after the transfer of power, even Savarna youth are being forced to seek relief in extremely limited opportunities that may come through reservation? More than the proximate reasons pushing youth of this or that caste into agitations for reservations, such fundamental questions must be raised. We must get into a critical examination of all the growth strategies followed since 1947. On the Specificities of Brahmanist Hindu Fascism Fascism as a political ideology has its origins in the crisis-ridden monopoly capitalism of imperialist countries. It is a form of bourgeois rule. The growth of neo-fascist political parties and the repeated electoral successes of rightist and imperialist countries are directly related to the continuing economic slowdown experienced in those countries, triggered by the financial crisis of 2007 through 2008. They are greatly aided by the resurgence of narrow nationalism, which portrays the other, mostly identified as immigrants, as the main cause for economic stress. As a form of bourgeois rule, elements of the fascist ideology are quite often internalized by the modern ruling classes of the third world, i.e. the oppressed countries, as well. It is blended with the autocratic, rule-by-edict system of rule commonly seen in the past in their feudal regimes all over the world. In the imperialist countries also, fascism resurrected aspects of the feudal polity, replacing bourgeois democracy's rule of law and formal equality. But there's a difference in the oppressed nations stemming from persisting semi-feudal, socioeconomic, and cultural relations. As a result, even when forms of bourgeois rule, like parliamentary system, exist, they are inherently flawed. The blending is a permanent feature. The switchover from a formal parliamentary system, with constitutionally assured rights to the blatant suppression of democratic rights, has an economic dimension even in an oppressed country. The difference lies in the near-total permanence of economic distress. When it comes to the situation in India, the inherent flaw of the parliamentary system is often discounted or ignored by mainstream political analysts. They consider this country to be a mature democracy compared to other third world countries. The decades-long sustenance of the parliamentary system and a separation of powers between the legislature, executive, and judiciary are given as proof. Fascist rule, like the one seen during the emergency imposed by Indira Gandhi, is taken to be an aberration. A closer look would reveal something else. For example, the application of the one-person, one-vote principle in India produces results quite opposite to the promise of political equality, even if formal, it is supposed to assure. As worn by Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, what it actually does is to reproduce a, quote, permanent communal majority, unquote, rather than a changeable, quote, political majority, unquote. An examination of the caste composition of the Lok Sabha proves him correct. The BJP has replaced the Congress as the main political representative of the ruling classes. So long as the Congress was in that position, it enjoyed solid backing from the Savarna Hindus. They have now shifted their allegiance to the BJP. Meanwhile, the new Lok Sabha, or LS, also remains overwhelmingly Savarna Hindu. Their share in members of parliament, or MP, is nearly half of the total. Though the political dispensation has changed, the communal majority enjoyed by the Savarna Hindus throughout the nearly seven decades of the Indian parliamentary system remains unchanged. This then is the context in which we must situate and analyze the fascism being promoted in India, presently by the Rashtraya Swayamsevak Song, RSS, through the Modi government. 
It is an outgrowth of the reactionary foundations on which the Indian parliamentary system rests. By reactionary foundations, I mean persisting semi-feudalism and bureaucrat capitalism unique to all oppressed countries. But that is not all. It also represents a further step in the ruling class's project to tackle and overcome the long-standing legitimacy crisis they have been facing for decades. Under the RSS dispensation, it has acquired a distinct hue and doubly venomous content. This makes it appropriate to name it Brahminist Hindu Fascism. But Brahminism is by no means restricted to the Song Paravar, the larger grouping of organizations spawned by the RSS. Therefore, to make an accurate analysis of this fascism, it must be done in a broader context. The aggressive Brahminist stance advocated by the RSS and other Hindu Vadi forces existed parallel to the Gandhi Nehru ideological theme from the beginning itself vigorously contesting it all along. But that stream never gained traction among the ruling classes. In the aftermath of the Gandhi assassination, it even faced severe isolation and suppression. Yet it was never completely excluded. On the contrary, it had always been allowed some space, even if limited. The passage of this aggressive Brahminist stance from the margins to the dominant position it now enjoys and the hegemonic consensus of the ruling classes has been the most significant development in the Indian polity during the past few decades. It can be properly situated and understood only if it's viewed in the light of the legitimacy crisis of the Indian state and the direction taken in the recasting of the ruling class's hegemonic consensus. Otherwise, one will remain trapped in the superficiality of parliamentary politics. Brahminism has always been at the core of the Indian ruling class's ideological makeup. It was a key ingredient during the emergence, coalescence, and alliance forging of these classes during the British period as ruling classes in the making slash waiting. Yet this was not the Brahminism of the Middle Ages, of caste feudalism. Complying with the pressures and influences of colonial modernity, it was recast, remolded. Moreover, throughout this period, in keeping with the changing demands to be addressed while shaping the consensus being forged under the hegemony of these classes, its articulation and stance had been modified. This became particularly noticeable with the formation of the Indian National Congress, or INC, in the late 19th century, and its successful positioning at the van of the anti-colonial struggle. The forging of a hegemonic consensus is never a top-down, linear affair. It always has to respond to and even adapt to the pressures from below from the people. The gradual awakening of the broad masses to political life under colonialism thus soon found its resonance in a deepening rift within the INC between the quote moderates unquote and the quote militants unquote. The latter's insistence on political action as opposed to the petitioning of the former gained them favor among the masses, but there was also another side to this. The militants unabashedly defended Brahminism as a matter of national pride. They explicitly placed it as an integral component of the Indianness sought to be articulated by them. Social reforms were vigorously resisted. This exclusion of the social reformist agenda had its repercussions, both with their own agencies and as a response to the uncompromising Brahminism espoused by militant leaders like B.G. Tillak, more and more social sections began to distance themselves from the Congress. The militant stream thus ran into a dead end. This prepared the entry of M.K. Gandhi and a new recasting of the hegemonic consensus being forged. In the new dispensation, the stress was on Brahminism's capacity to retain and extend its domination through accommodating and assimilating the quote other unquote. The concerns of all those social sections organizing and struggling outside the Congress were partially addressed. The INC expanded into a conglomeration of diverse interest groups headed by the emerging ruling classes. The Brahminism they favored during this period was implicit. It was one of moderation infused with prominent aspects of modernity's political symbols. Take the case of the local elite's imagining of an Indian nation. This was made possible by colonialism. As such, it was a very modern product. Yet it was also useful to breathe new life into Brahminism's dream of a Bharat spanning the whole subcontinent. Simultaneously, by providing a sense of ancient origins, Brahminism allowed this creation of colonialism to be conceived as a resurgence of a held-back, glorious past. Continuing as an integral component of this Indianness, Brahmanism was now positioned implicitly, embedded in the discourses of modernity. The Brahmanist precept of unity and diversity secures its supremacy by deeming all diversity to be mere manifestations of a quote one unquote acclaimed by it. This was now projected as the ethos of the Indian nation, thus placing it at the root of all the actually existing nationalities. Gandhi was instrumental in this whole endeavor. Many others also contributed. Jawaharlal Nehru, brought in a, quote, Western, unquote, slant, with economic, quote, development, unquote, as a major theme. Under neocolonial conditions of indirect imperialist control and exploitation, the semblance of independence is of much importance for the local ruling classes as well as for imperialism. 
Post-1947, imperialist designed and funded projects and technology were absorbed. Deeper penetration of foreign finance capital was welcomed. All of this was heralded as development, right in the midst of this heightened dependence. Thus, the false consciousness of independence and development became crucial in the new hegemonic consensus. The pretension of secularism was yet another one of its prominent ingredients. Secularism can only mean the separation of the state from religion, making it the private affair of a citizen. This was never the case in India. Instead, the state's, quote, equal treatment of all religions, unquote, was deemed a secularism. In practice, it always favored the majority religious community. Religious minorities, especially the Muslims, were dealt with in a prejudiced manner. The dismal conditions of the Muslim masses, even after more than five decades of secular rule, was well exposed in the Sakar Committee report. Yes, there certainly has been a spike in attacks on Muslims under the Modi Raj. The unabashed justification of such attacks by their perpetrators, the apathy of government's agencies, the socio-political cultural milieu, where such murderous incidents get accommodated as the quote, new normal, unquote, these are surely new developments. However, one must also not forget that they have their antecedents in decades-old state and non-state violence against Muslims and other religious minorities. This, quote, new normal, unquote, also needs to be situated in the socio-political process it has emerged from in which it further embellishes. Otherwise, we would end up in a simplistic and artificial divisions. The distinction sought between a supposedly, quote, secular democratic, unquote, past and a threatening, quote, ethnic democratic, unquote, future is one such example. An index offered for such differentiation is the underrepresentation of Muslims in the Lok Sabha. The fact is that this has been the norm throughout. It has never been anywhere close to their proportion in the population, right from the very first LS of 1952. Yet, just like the triumphalist sermons on, quote, self-reliance, unquote, mass deepening dependence on imperialism, secularism too remained a convenient disclaimer absolving the Indian state and the party in power of their communal crimes. These elements of the hegemonic consensus started to face severe stress from the 1960s onwards. The reality of imperialist dependence and the hollowness of the, quote, socialist, secular, democratic, unquote, claims of the rulers became more and more exposed. Their state's legitimacy was increasingly being challenged by various sections of the struggling masses and by national movements. The Naxalbari armed peasant rebellion shook up the whole country. Attempting to regain ground and restore the hegemonic consensus, the INC, led by Indira Gandhi, first tried a mix of populism coupled with fascist rule. When that failed, an ideological remolding raising the need to revise hitherto sanctioned views on caste-based reservation, secularism, and other elements of the old consensus was promoted. The state-controlled, public sector-led economic model began to be dismantled. The semblance of self-reliance made for a deeper penetration of transnational corporations, or TNC. All of this would take a leap with a collapse of the Soviet Union and the wholesale promotion of the globalization agenda in the 1990s, there was greater concentration of power at the center of the prime minister's office emerged as the real center of power. Congress ideologues began to openly raise the need to shift to a presidential style of elections and governance in the place of existing Westminster model. Elections began to be focused on personalities. The recasting of the hegemonic consensus was accompanied by a conscious attempt to bind the Savarna Hindu castes into an all-India compact as a core social base of the state. Energetic promotion of, quote, national integration, unquote, Vicious suppression of revolutionary movements and nationality struggles and aggressive expansionist acts against neighboring countries, all of these were put in the service of fanning up national chauvinism, now openly given a Hindu communal color. Over the years, the undertones of the new hegemonic consensus being shaped became more and more apparent as an explicit Brahmanism, packaged as a resurgent Hinduism. All sections of the ruling classes, their political representatives across the whole spectrum from right to left, have endorsed and promoted it. The attack on the Golden Temple, pogroms against the Sikhs, the opening of the Babri Majid, giving a boost to the RSS's plans eventually leading to its demolition, all this took place under Congress rule. Rajiv Gandhi symbolically launched his Lok Sabha election campaign from IOTA. This was also the period when a Supreme Court bench had conveniently declared Hindutva to be a way of life, greatly aiding the RSS and other Hindu bodies. While the ruling classes as a whole endorsed the promotion of explicit Brahmanism, they differed among themselves, and still do, on the limits of its aggressiveness and the modes of its articulation. The extension of reservation to the intermediary caste, or OBCs, at the central level by the VP Singh's government's implementation of the Mandal Commission's recommendations, and the rise of caste-based parties, like the Samajwadi Party, or SP, and the Bahujan Samaj Party, or BSP, were two important developments during this period. Were they concurrence to the ideological remolding going on? These developments are often lumped together and termed the, quote, mandalization of the polity, unquote. 
However, the social dynamics underlying them were distinct. They need to be examined separately. The implementation of the Mandal recommendation certainly was a tactical move aimed at checking the RSS's game plan, but that was not all. It was also intended to ease caste contradictions inevitably sharpened by the promotion of explicit Brahmanism, and thus related to the overall design of the consensus recasting being pursued. Similar in intention was the country-wide celebration of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar's birth centenary, also initiated from the center by the VP Singh government. In the process, he was being positioned as some sort of, quote, father of the constitution, unquote, and co-opted into the ruling class's political pantheon. His primary and prominent role in the anti brahminist struggle was thus backsided. Struggles to get the Mandal recommendations implemented, going against Savarna resistance, did produce a new awareness among the oppressed castes. To that extent, it brought forth a countercurrent and also gave a boost to the growth of caste-based parties, but their formation and growth were essentially propelled by a different dynamic. The breaking away of social sections from the Congress conglomeration was already underway. It was not limited to the Dalit and intermediary castes alone. In some states, Savarna castes concerned over the prospects of being sidelined in state politics moved away from the Congress. In some others, caste and nationality interests combined, allowing the formation of a broader breakaway. It was propelled by nationality-based exploiting classes trying to shake off the control of an all-India party in order to facilitate their growth by gaining greater and direct control over governmental power at the state level. In yet other regions, alienation from the Congress was spurred on by economic stagnation arising from the plateauing of the, quote, Green Revolution, unquote. Overall, these developments indicated the sharpening of contradictions, economic, political, and social. The new parties that emerged represented the aspirations and concerns of new elites forming within various social sections located in the nationalities and cultural regions. It opened up the spell of coalition governments, with and without an all-India party as anchor. The political training this gave rise to did complicate the ruling class's ideological project as well. However, soon enough the new elites were also integrated with the ruling classes and became participants in its remolding exercise. The metamorphosis of the BSP from Savarna baiting to locating its own symbols in Brahminist iconography is a striking example of this transition. The Sangparavar stands at an extreme in the explicit Brahminism commonly endorsed by the ruling classes. However, it would be wrong to identify this as an, quote, exclusionist, unquote, position, as opposed to some, quote, inclusiveness, unquote, favored by others like the Congress. Brahminism thrives on the graded assimilation of the other. It excludes the other from an equal status precisely by allowing such graded space to it. It privileges itself by what may be termed as a, quote, exclusionist inclusion, unquote. There is therefore nothing new or unusual in the sermons of RSS leaders on being inclusive, even while their fascist minions go around lynching Muslims and Dalits. Modi's tacking on Sabka Viswas, to his earlier spiel of Sabka Sath, Sabka Vikas, is very much a part of this. Other than its extreme and aggressiveness, the shaping being given by the RSS to the hegemonic consensus has its own specificity. They are born of compulsions particular to it. To put its stamp on it, the RSS must recast it completely, displacing and marginalizing the Gandhi Nehru legacy. This is being done through an exercise in the dehyphenation of the Gandhi Nehru pair. While Gandhi is given a makeover projecting his quote localness, unquote, Nehru is vehemently excluded, emphasizing his quote foreignness. Unquote. The Congress has all along staked a monopoly claim on representing the country all along by foregrounding its role as the main political stream in the anti colonial struggle. This was a major facet of the old consensus. The Gandhi Nehru legacy is tightly enmeshed with it. So long as it retains some credibility, the form one throning of an RSS brand aggressive Brahminism at the core of the new hegemonic consensus cannot be realized with full force. Crude substitution of its aggressive stance in place of the benign one of the Gandhi Nehru theme, while leaving the latter's claim to an exceptional anti colonial pedigree unchallenged, is not feasible. The historical record of the Song Paravar and its founding leaders simply won't allow it. They kept away from the anti British struggle. The broader Hinduvadi forces, too, were no better. Given this burden of its past, the RSS has been energetically pursuing a multi pronged strategy aimed at manufacturing its own nationalist narrative. This ranges from crude chauvinism centered on flaunting symbols and slogans born of its bigotry to the appropriation of historical icons of past struggles, social as well as national. Facts are stretched to prove the participation of the RSS in the anti colonial struggle. In order to offset the Congress's monopoly claim on that struggle, it publicized all other streams hitherto ignored or sign-lined in official narratives. 
those led by communists and Muslims are carefully avoided. In all of this, a repositioning or rereading of their icons as votaries of Hindu Vada, even if as mild ones, is sought to be realized. Along with this, it has gone all out to establish its brand of communal chauvinism as the sole credential of patriotism. We are also treated to big talk on India's arriving on the world stage as a power by its own strength. Under Modi, this propaganda has been taken to ridiculous heights even as India is getting tightly tied up into the U.S. military web. While the India as a world power balloon is blown up by the RSS with Modi as a poster boy, the risk of the Indian people getting dragged into U.S. instigated conflicts has greatly heightened. The RSS is trying best to draw the Dalit, intermediary castes, and Adivasis into its folds. Through this, it tries to address two separate yet interrelated challenges. One of them is of an ideological nature. It is that of papering over the inevitable sharpening of social divisions that accompany the promotion of aggressive Brahmanism. The blatant attempt to appropriate Ambedkar is an example. The other challenge is born of immediate electoral compulsions, i.e. the need to form broad caste-based alliances. It needs this to offset the threat posed by caste-based parties like the BSP or SP. The Congress too had its caste, communal, electoral alliance, mostly Savarna Dalit Muslim. In the case of the RSS, it has the burden of squaring its alliances with its aggressive brand of Brahmanism, normally repulsive to these castes. It is sought to do this by playing on intra-Dalit, intra-intermediary caste contradictions. It has succeeded in building a broad alliance, pulling in the smaller Dalit and intermediary castes. Much more than the successful appeal of a quote common unquote Hinduness standing above caste divisions or the chemistry of Modi, this secured its greater vote shares and seats in the states like UP and Bihar. To give the example of UP, these castes remain relatively disadvantaged vis-a-vis those like Jatav or Yadav, dominant among the Taoist and intermediary castes of the state. A combination of the Savarnas, non-Yadav intermediary castes, and non-Jatav Dalits easily outstrips the Jatav, Yadav, and Muslims who collectively come to only 40%. This was the basic arithmetic at work, the one of caste. Apart from the shrewdness of such electoral tactics, what is of more interest in the long run is the material grounds that allow their successful deployment. An elite has emerged within the oppressed castes. They are getting Brahmanized in direct proportion to the growth of their exploitive interests. On their own, they have been sanitizing their struggling past and leaders to suit them to their current interests and supposedly improve social status. Hence, there is much that is complementary between the social dynamics driving these elites and the RSS's appropriation strategy. Any attempt to counter the RSS's electoral tactics with exclusively caste-based alliances thus inevitably runs into an inherent obstacle. In India, the parliamentary system remains the preferred form of governance due to certain particularities of the country. The first of these is its extreme social fragmentation, with its abundance of castes, communal groupings, nationalities, ethnicities, and regional identities. The second one is the absence of a dominant nationality or cohesive social group that could be made the social base of the state. Neither the Hindi belt, nor the Savarna Hindus, or even the Hindus as a whole, can satisfy this need. Each of them is riven with divisions. Greater doses of Brahmanism only go to harden them, even as they join up against the other, the Muslims. These are the unique conditions of our society that make the parliamentary system eminently suitable for the ruling classes. It allows some distribution of governmental power and opportunity to corner a share of the spoils of exploitation. It has the potential to accommodate various echelons of the exploitative classes, even some layers of the middle classes, and of course, varying patterns of caste representation. All this can be done while maintaining and exercising the overall hegemony of the ruling classes. The functioning of the parliamentary system surely does generate a lot of centrifugal pulls and complicates central governance. The resolution of the legitimacy crisis may finally end up with a more centralized presidential system with an elected president enjoying executive powers and a curtailment of fundamental rights. Even then, the parliamentary system with its layers of governmental and administrative potential for co-option will most likely be retained alongside it. Buoyed up by their sweeping victory, BJP leaders boast that this is now going to be repeated for several coming elections. This is a baseless claim. If not for Pulawama and the Balakot airstrike, the outcome of the recent elections would not have been so favorable to it. Given the dim global economic scene, further complicated by aggressive protectionism, and the growing contention among the big imperialist powers, the prospects of an economic upturn in India are rather bleak. The huge majority the BJP has won is not going to change this material reality, just as it did not during its last term. A slew of anti-people, anti-labor legislation, more sell-offs of public assets, 
and greater easing of conditions for the penetration of imperialist capital, all packaged as, quote, bold reforms, unquote, are already on its way. Coupled with this is the promotion of rabid jingoism and communal Muslim baiting. However, given the above scene, they are unlikely to be of much use in terms of triggering, quote, growth, unquote, for whatever that is worth. The only outcome one can reliably predict is that these measures will surely call up larger sections of the masses into struggle. As a result, the electoral prospects of the BJP may well get reversed as its present term progresses. The larger question still remains, how can the promotion of the explicit, aggressive Brahminism be countered and reversed? Can a revival of the Congress and its allies assure this? Right now, the Congress finds itself in a rather unfavorable situation. The two ends holding up its traditional vote alliance, the Savarnas and Dalits, have pulled away, damning it to crash. Though varying from state to state, its Muslim vote base is on the whole holding up. But that won't be of much help by itself. Even though it is hanging on to the Gandhi Nehru legacy, this is more an appearance than substance. It is no less explicit in its Brahminism or aggressive in the advocacy of the globalization agenda. Given its class nature, it cannot but be so. Besides, since globalization with a human face is now part of the imperialist agenda, there is not much it can offer by way of social welfare that cannot be met in equal measure by the BJP. As for foreign policy, the tilt towards the U.S. and willingness to get entangled in its military web was initiated by the Congress itself. Here, too, it cannot offer anything new other than some fine calibration. Despite all of this, the Congress is not going to be wiped out of existence. Modi is not going to be granted his wish of a Congress muck to India. The ruling classes still need it as an all-India counterpoint, a role no state party can fulfill. The chances of the Congress making a comeback by gaining a majority on its own are extremely remote, but it can hope to regain power as part of a coalition. As was proven by the UPA 1 and 2, a coalition with the Congress as its anchor is quite acceptable and workable for the ruling classes and imperialism. Moreover, a functioning Congress is necessary for them for a more fundamental reason. A parliamentary system can remain meaningful only so long as the possibility of switching parties from government to opposition benches and vice versa is retained. As noted earlier, the parliamentary system remains the preferred form of governance in India due to certain particularities of the country. Since the promotion of explicit Brahmanism is not something simply limited to Hindavadi outfits like the RSS, it would be futile to seek weapons against it in the Congress or other parliamentary parties. Neither will they come away from the Gandhi Nehru arsenal. The task is to confront and undermine the ruling class's hegemonic consensus being forged with explicit, aggressive Brahmanism as its core. That cannot be fulfilled by seeking refuge in the benign Brahmanism of the Gandhi Nehru type. Moreover, democracy has no obligation to defend this legacy against the Hindu bodies. The liberalism it displayed, the democracy it professed, was superficial. It avoided the basic issues of democratization in our context, even those of a bourgeois nature. This Savarna stream of democracy was satisfied with modifications in caste feudalism and the reworking of Brahmanism to suit the modern needs of the exploiters, new and old. It must not be confused or equated with the democratic values generated by the masses through their struggles or the rights they have gained through them. At various levels and in varying degrees, these dealt with the basic issues of democratization. They dealt with its political, social, economic, and cultural dimensions. Not the Savarna stream of democracy, but the Sarvarna stream with its roots going all the way back down to the anti-Brahminist Bhakti movements, must be made the basis for any meaningful struggle against the Brahminist fascist agenda of the RSS and its cohorts. However, a mere recall of those values and teachings will not suffice. All of those movements emerged from and responded to existing conditions. They cannot be simply stretched out to suit our times. The material conditions have given rise to the Brahminist Hindu fascism within the recasting of the ruling class's hegemonic consensus are a complex ensemble. Not just the interests of the ruling classes, those of contemporary imperialism are also enmeshed with it. Present-day Brahminism is not the old one. It is neither that of the colonial period, nor even of the early decades after the transfer of power in 1947. For example, it is conscious of the heightened awareness seen among various oppressed social sections. New tools and strategies to co-opt their leaders and subvert them are being developed by it. Moreover, class division is very much present and growing among the Sarvanas too. Among the peasants murdered by government policies and misguidedly recorded as, quote, suicides, unquote, a good number come from these castes. So too is a large share among the impoverished laborers in urban centers. The concerns of all oppressed sections, including these, should be addressed while drawing on the people's traditions of anti brahminist struggles. This cannot be done through caste or religious community alliances, no matter how representative they are. It cannot be done through the parliamentary system. 
What is needed are grassroots movements, movements that address class, caste, gender, ethnic, religious minority, nationality, regional, and environmental issues need to be promoted. A broad, radical democratic platform and a counter-consensus must be given shape through them. This is what is needed to build a powerful, consistent struggle against the RSS and the fascist cohorts within the broader, radical perspective of confronting the ruling classes. Some Semi-Feudal Traits of the Indian Parliamentary System Over the years, there has been a steady increase in the number of dynasts, i.e., progeny continuing the MP-slash-MLA profession of their families. Their share has gone up to 8.6% from the negligible 0.7% in 1952, seen in the first Lok Sabha. That comes to a 12-fold increase. Dynasts are certainly not unique to the political realm. They are everywhere in India, in the higher judiciary, higher echelons of the bureaucracy and armed forces, in the corporate world, and of course, in the media and entertainment fields. So what does this reveal? Is it a mere indication of an unseemly, nepotistic streak seen among some of the privileged? No, nepotism is not the cause. It is merely the actualization of a systemic feature of our society. These dynasts seen in diverse fields indicate the presence of semi-feudalism. It is intrinsic to all the structures and social realms bequeathed by colonial modernity and further embellished under neocolonialism. The Zamindari, with its land and privileges, was passed on from generation to generation. So too our electoral constituencies retained for years together as family seats and handed over to successive generations. Not just constituencies, whole political parties have become family property. When there is no direct issue who can become the quote rightful unquote heir, a nephew is summoned to fulfill the need. The operative word here is family, or rather family control, to be more precise. All parliamentary parties in India, except those of the left, can be safely described as systems of families and their alliances, arrayed from the highest to the lowest level. The BJP is no exception, despite being born, manned, and led by a cadre organization like the RSS. Excluding its highest level, dynastic families and electoral jiggers are very much part of it. It too has its fair share of dynasts and the present Lok Sabha. The semi-feudalism manifested through political dynasts is seen in yet another striking feature of the Indian parliamentary system. This is the business of defections. The ease with which defections are carried out is a sharp exposure of how inconsequential the mass of electors really are, except when they are summoned to vote. Defections do attract opprobrium and are seen as morally reprehensible. Yet it is also accepted as a legitimate tool for pulling down a government or manufacturing a majority. The law does not prohibit defections, it only regulates them. An elected representative switching allegiance from one party to another apparently looks like some greedy, power-hungry individual's treachery, but there is more to it. That person won't be coming alone. She or he will also bring over a large chunk of assured votes. These could be caste or communal vote banks. When the defector is a political dynast, such gain is guaranteed beyond all doubt. In recent years, the BJP has been perfecting this tool. In fact, defections have played a major role in the gains it has recently made, perhaps even more than the Modi factor, in rabid hindu Vadi chauvinism. Defections became a regular feature of parliamentary politics around the late 1960s and early 1970s. Its coincidence with the beginning of the legitimacy crisis of the state and the weakening of the Congress system was not accidental. It was both a reflection and product of those developments. Defections are accompanied by material benefits, a ministership, chairpersonship, and of course, suitcases stuffed with cash. However, that does not explain the whole phenomenon. The ease with which in block defections take place nowadays is indicative of something more, something that can be characterized as a seamless ideological milieu. One of its facets is crass cynicism, the awareness among political agents of the ruling class is that there is nothing that could even remotely be termed as principled in their political system and the knowledge that the electorate also knows this quite well. The other facet is the general agreement among all shades of ruling class politicians on the need for a recasting of the hegemonic consensus, their common acceptance of the need for one or another form of explicit Brahmanism, and subservience to the globalization agenda of imperialism. Given this, being in this or that party hardly makes a difference. Since most voters are tied to this or that leader rather than allied to a political platform, They do not feel much compunction in pressing some new button as instructed from above. This is now increasingly true of the parliamentary left's traditional vote base as well. The wholesale shifting of left voters to the BJP seen in Bengal is explained by some as an act of desperation meant to hold off the immediate threat posed by the Trinamool. That was in play, no doubt. 
More important, however, is their susceptibility to the RSS's communal propaganda. Puja celebrations, with all of its Brahminist rituals, have been officially enthroned in the parliamentary left's mass politics in Magal for decades. The distance from there to the sword-waving Ram Navami processions of the RSS is not all that great. Sitaram Yachuri, the CPM secretary, is reported to have criticized the Congress for trying to counter the RSS with soft Hindutva. Have this party and its allies on the left been offering anything distinctly different? Take the case of Kuralam, where the Sabaramala issue was capitalized by the Sang Paravar, ably aided by the Pinar Ayi government with its ham-handed handling of the issue. A belated attempt was made by the CPM to counter the RSS propaganda by appealing to the social reform traditions of Kuralam and even mobilizing locks to form a symbolic, quote, woman's wall, unquote. Despite all this, it had to face the ignominy of trailing the BJP in six assembly constituencies, something unprecedented. Evidently, a good chunk of Hindu voters, traditionally with the left democratic front, had switched their preference to the BJP. Was this a temporary affair? A case of those voters getting momentarily swayed by the RSS propaganda? The fact of the matter is that the CPM and its left allies have departed from the anti brahminist democratic values of the social reform movements and even those of their struggling past. They had long since abandoned any meaningful, consistent effort to propagate those values. A large number of the leaders, cadres, and almost all of their mass followings are fully involved in the day-to-day affairs of communal caste organizations. They are present in temple, mosque, and church committees. There they function with as much conservative, obscurantist zeal as those from other parties like the Congress or BJP. The misogynist prohibition of menstruating women from the Sabara Mala is of recent origins. It was part of a conscious effort to deepen the Brahmanization of that temple, originally a shrine, of the Mala Araya at Avasis. Yet despite having trade unions and staunch party cadres within the temple administration, neither the CPM nor its allies ever took a stand against this move or tried to conscientize the believers. The harsh social reality in Kuralam is that today the minds, thinking and social practices of the average LDF sympathizer is quite communal and castus. Normally they are not rabid like someone in the Singh Paravar's sphere of influence, but they can easily be turned in that direction. This was the potential actualized in the recent elections by the BJP. The Maoist Party What should be the qualities of an organization to become the vanguard of a new society in humans? What should be the methods of party building corresponding to this? And what should be the position of the party within the dictatorship of the proletariat? Can a proletarian party retain its communist qualities today without becoming a Maoist party? Is the Maoist party just another name for a communist party? Or does it contain something new in its very nature and methods of work? In the capitalist age, classes or sections within them express and realize their interests mainly through the instrument of a political party, a social organization. Marx posed the necessity for the proletariat to form its own party in order to achieve its aims in contending with enemy classes. This was developed as a scientific theory, verified and established through practice by Lenin. The core of the Leninist party concept are the professional revolutionaries, those who devote themselves completely to revolutionary activity, who make this their profession. It has been criticized that this leads to an elite who lords over the proletariat. Furthermore, Lenin's viewpoint that workers cannot, on their own, arrive at the ideology guiding their liberation, his proposition that it must be reached to them from outside, has been remarked on as a celebration of elitism. The Leninist party concept is accused of being the concrete expression of this mindset, one that undervalues the potential of the workers. Some argue that while the evils of this party concept were held in check by Lenin's personal qualities so long as he was alive, they broke out in a monstrous death dance under Stalin. Let us first acquaint ourselves with the ideological struggles that took place on this issue during the period in which the Leninist party concept took form. Its starting point was the debate in the Second Congress of the Undivided Russian Communist Party, then known as the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, on the matter of the party constitution. The rightists, Trotsky included, accused Lenin's draft statutes of promoting ultra-centralization. Even his insistence on membership criteria that made it mandatory to join a party committee and participate in its practice was, in their view, an example of unwanted centralization. Their counterproposal would allow anyone who helped the party become a member. They would thus make it a loose organization of spare time activists. This was the crux of the difference between Lenin and his adversaries. Lenin clearly realized the need for an organization of those prepared to be frontline activists in a revolutionary movement aimed at seizing power, those who devoted their whole lives to this task, and thus acquired the necessary leadership qualities and skills. His party concept evolved from this vision. 
The specific situation in Tsarist Russia, which ruled out all open activity and made it imperative to constantly evade the secret police, certainly was a major influencing factor in this. The weight of such specificities can be seen in Lenin's insistence on the total centralization to be enjoyed by the party's leading body and the strict division of tasks, almost like the division of labor in a modern factory, among different party committees and committee members. But it must also be noted that a departure from the Second International's party concept was implicit in this approach, though the immediate context it addressed was the Russian situation. This is where Lenin separated from his contemporaries on the party question. Leaving aside diehard rightist attacks, let us elaborate this by getting into the criticisms made by Rosa Luxemburg, and also Trotsky, who was in the revolutionary camp for a while. Luxembourg characterized Lenin as the representative of the quote, ultra-centralist, unquote, tendency within the Russian revolutionary movement. This criticism was grounded in her view on the relation between the revolutionary mass movement and the party. Luxembourg argued that, quote, the fact is that the social democracy is not joined to the organization of the proletariat. It is itself the proletariat. And because of this, social democratic centralism is essentially different from blankist centralism. It is, so to speak, the self-centralism of the advanced sectors of the proletariat. It is the rule of the majority within its own party. Centralism in the socialist sense is not an absolute thing applicable to any phase whatsoever of the labor movement. It is a tendency, which becomes real in proportion to the development and political training acquired by the working masses in the course of their struggle, unquote. This narration, with its emphasis on the voluntary nature of a Communist Party centralization, more or less negates the difference between the class and its advanced elements, between the party and the broad revolutionary movement. Though the word Luxembourg uses is self-centralism, in effect it becomes synonymous to spontaneous. The thinning out of this demarcation is also visible in Trotsky's contestation. Quote, If the division of labor can be considered as an organizational principle, it can only be in a factory, but never in a political party of any kind, still less in ours, is it not obvious to us that the principle of the division of labor, in no way characteristic of the organization which has made it its task to develop the class consciousness of the proletariat? Unquote. Lenin did not deny the voluntary nature of party centralization. It is not imposed, but voluntarily acceded to, consciously taken up by its members, keeping the interests of revolution in mind. This is Lenin's concept of voluntary centralization. Contrary to Luxembourg's tendency, which must be realized through the course of struggles, for Lenin, the methods of a centralized party, including its division of tasks, is something to be consciously established and trained in from the very beginning. Yet this does not negate the positiveness of a revolutionary spontaneity. To reiterate, Lenin's point of departure was the type of organization needed to organize and carry out revolution. He arrived at a solution by accessing the concrete situation of the enemy and the people, rather than starting from some preconceived notion of revolution, or of the proletariat and its development. Thus, during the revolutionary upheaval of 1905, in place of the strictest centralization and guarded recruitment he began favoring until then, Lenin argued for forms of organization capable of incorporating the greatest number of militant working class masses. This was not a case of Lenin going against Leninism, it was Leninism. In this instance, he was guided by the assessment that the revolutionary zeal of the masses, seen in that situation, would to a large extent make up for their ideological, political weaknesses. His proposal displayed deep faith in the masses and a dialectical grasp of the relation between conscious steps and spontaneity within a revolutionary movement. Without doubt, Leninist centralization and organizational principles are not some absolutes meant to be implemented regardless of the stage. Its work division does not abandon the task of raising the consciousness of the whole party membership and the widest possible mass. Did the later-day international communist movement lose Lenin's exemplary, dialectical, handling of the vanguard concept and organizational methods he formulated? It would be far more beneficial to pay attention to such differences rather than running after individual traits of leaders as Pearson does. Lenin was concerned about the dangers posed by universalizing Bolshevik party statutes, regardless of time and place. In a report to the Communist International, or Comintern, Lenin observed that its organizational principles had a strong Russian flavor and doubted whether comrades from other countries would be able to grasp it properly. In those days of haste to rupture from the loose organizational methods of the Second International, this concern didn't draw attention. Meanwhile, stricter centralization was demanded of the Russian Communist Party, which was now a ruling party. The iron unity of the party was of critical importance for the very existence of the revolutionary state. This was the context in which the 10th Congress of the Russian Party decided to end all groups within the party in their publications, departing from its existent practice. Later, it became part of the foundations of Communist Party organizational principles. 
Throughout this period, Lenin, the Russian party, and the common turn were of the view that a revolutionary advance was imminent in Western Europe. Political developments in various countries testified to this. The immediacy of this situation must certainly have influenced the formulation of organizational principles. However, the revolutionary situation that had been forming dissipated. At that point, Lenin drew attention to the need for a thorough evaluation in order to work out future steps in the situation of Ebb. But before he could grapple with this, he was beridden by an assassin's bullets and died. It is not known whether the party concept and its organizational principles were among the issues he had in mind for review. At any rate, this was not what was seen later. Statutes and methods of work adopted in a particular situation were later theorized in a very mechanical manner. Stalin's concept of a monolithic party was prominent among his mechanical heirs. This was the model followed by the international communist movement until it was criticized by Mao. An outlook of worshipping the party as a power that could not be questioned and was always correct was strengthened. The influence of mechanical thinking, which denied internal contradictions in class struggle and socialism, was evident in Stalin's party concept. It was not grasped as a space of active contradictions, as an organic entity which must continually renew its leadership position and relevance in society by grappling with external and internal contradictions. Ideological struggle became formal. Democratic centralism froze into relations of domination and subservience. As could be expected, a difference was seen in this between parties in power and those struggling for it. In the latter case, the necessities of sustaining under enemy suppression compelled greater reliance on the people. Self-criticism, rectification, and ideological struggles over such issues livened up the atmosphere in the party. Yet the constrictions of the monolithic party concept were ever-present. Purging of membership gained prominence compared to ideological rectification. So long as the party maintained its Marxist-Leninist orientation, this usually meant removal of those who had lost their communist qualities. But even then, ideology took a back seat in the whole process. The organizational aspect stood out. Mao broke away from this negative tradition and the mechanical thinking underlying it. His was literally a reconstruction of the vanguard concept, and it opened the way to a deeper, richer understanding of the proletariat's leading role in the Leninist party. Mao's departure from existent thinking on the party concept can be seen right from the very beginning. His report on the Hunan Peasant Movement, written in 1927, observed that any revolutionary party failing to give leadership to the insurgent peasantry would be rejected. This statement that the peasants, seen as backwards in Marxist theory until then, test and determine the revolutionary character of a proletarian party, was nothing but a daring subversion of absolutist thinking on the leading role of the Communist Party. It provided space to problematize the proletariat's historical leading role in the vanguard concept. Though other classes and social sections will be important partners in the historical movement to destroy capitalism, i.e. its highest stage of imperialism, they cannot provide leadership. In each instance, the issue of liberation is specific. Land in the case of landless peasants, caste oppression for Dalits, male chauvinism for women, ethnic oppression for Adivasis, national oppression for oppressed people, religious persecution for minorities, and so on. Being specific, they are also partial, in the context of the whole revolutionary project. But this is not the situation of the proletariat. Capitalist bondage is different from earlier exploiting systems like caste feudalism. It imposes no other compulsion on the workers other than the pangs of hunger. And since, in principle, they are free, there can be no specific liberation suiting them, and so every form of exploitation and oppression must be ended. Thus, the emancipation of the whole of humanity becomes a precondition for the liberation of this class. The leading role of the proletariat derives from this objective social position. It obliges the proletariat to continue the revolution all the way up to realizing a world rid of exploitation. If this Marxist understanding of proletarian leadership is absolutized, it would certainly lead to reification. Both the history and present of the international communist movement illustrate how this emerges with mechanical equations, where proletariat equals revolution and communist party equals vanguard. On the other hand, economist impulses often seen in the upper strata of the proletariat, social passivity engendered by revisionist reformist politics that strengthen its economism, and changes seen in the nature of labor and workplaces, have given rise to views that abandon the proletarian leadership concept. Carried away in the tide of identity politics, they believe that, in the future, these movements will give leadership to social change. Thus we have the two, reification of the proletariat and the Communist Party, selfishness that hoists this banner to justify fleeting necessities as common interests, at one end, and the lethargic plea to reduce our sights to the partial, to abandon the noble task of an exploitation-free world since it is a mere myth, at the other. Maoism cuts through this vicious circle. 
the leading role of the proletariat in the vanguard position of its Communist Party are potentialities contained in historical circumstances. They can only be realized through creative intervention in the historical moment of a specific society. Similar to other phenomena, this too is a unity of opposites. This was the import of Mao's warning in the Hunan Report. One sees the continuity with this in Mao's observation, made some 50 years later, quote, bourgeoisie is within the party itself, unquote. He arrived at this conclusion through the experiences of the restoration of capitalism in the Soviet Union and the Cultural Revolution unleashed in China to prevent it. This is something that cannot be grasped with Stalin's monolithic party concept. The bourgeois presence Mao called attention to was different from the possible infiltration of bourgeois agents and their corruption of party members. What Lenin and Stalin sought to check through purges, Mao was speaking about a new bourgeoisie. It is the product of residual capitalist production relations, such as bourgeois right, and the political-slash-ruling leading role of the Communist Party in the dictatorship of the proletariat, an inevitable element of socialism. The decisive factor in the struggle against this is the correct ideological-political line dealing with the multiple tasks of continuing the revolution and its further development. If a revisionist line seizes leadership, the bourgeoisie will become dominant in the party. The color of the party and the state will change. This poses yet another dialectic of the Communist Party's position as vanguard. The main source of the potential hazard we saw above does not lie with external influences. It is contained in the revolution it led, in the society thus created, in other words, in the emergent unity of opposites brought forth by its successful venture of being a vanguard. This potential is the mere opposite of leading the advance to communism. Which of them will be realized in a given socialist society is a matter to be settled by the class struggle taking place within the party and society in each concrete historical moment. Grasping the party as a unity of opposites, this is the point of rupture to firmly establish the Maoist party concept in both theory and practice. This is the point of rupture to firmly establish the Maoist party concept in both theory and practice. Taking lessons from the Chinese Revolution and the international communist movement, Mao elaborated a number of propositions on the party. One theme consistently stressed throughout is that of a firmly building up of the communist consciousness of serving the people by checking attitudes of superiority in the relations between the party and the people in the leadership and ranks. This does not deny the role or importance of leadership. Mao was contradicting an outlook that absolutized leadership and made the masses and ranks into disciples, passive instruments. He reminded communists that no matter how necessary cadres are, it is the masses who carry things out, and therefore it wouldn't do to exaggerate the role of cadres. He persists with this in the relation between the central committee and the lower committees, and that between the socialist state and the people. In the absence of information from the lower levels, the central leadership cannot arrive at correct decisions. At times, a solution may be arrived at in the lower level itself, in which case the task of the central committee is to propagate this throughout the country. Such observations of Mao demolish any idea of infallible leadership. They also help in bringing out the relation between the organizational principle of democratic centralism and the Marxist theory of knowledge. Mao pointed out that the struggle against the bourgeoisie was not the only element in class struggle under socialism. It included contradictions between the socialist state and people, and between the party and the people. Already in the 1950s, he warned that the people would teach those who thought they could lord over them now that power was seized. He advocated for the right of the people to strike and protest, saying that the Communist Party needed to learn a lesson. What is striking here is the importance he placed on struggle from below, the spontaneous initiative of the people. This grasp of the dialectical relation between conscious intervention from above and spontaneous pressure from below, this Leninist understanding lost by the international communist movement in the interregnum, was not just retaken by Mao. He took it to a new height by applying it in the Cultural Revolution and the struggle against the danger of capitalist restoration. Mao thus developed the party concept and established it on new foundations, not on some individual behavioral traits, but solid ideological political principles. To what extent could the Communist Party of China led by Mao imbibe this newness? This is a relevant question. It serves as an entry for assessing the extent to which the international movement that emerged in the 1960s, inspired by Mao Zedong thought, or the Maoists who laid claim to deeper clarity in the 1990s, has incorporated and actualized the Maoist Party concept. The Chinese Party was forged in the common turnist mold. That mold, as well as the CPC's background of having functioned at length with its methods and style, must be kept in mind while seeking an answer to our question. As we noted, Mao had started to break away from this model from the very beginning, but his new approach would really be established only through the Cultural Revolution. In fact, Mao's teachings on the party were systematically compiled only in 1974 in the Shanghai text, A Basic Understanding of the Communist Party of China. Three years later, one of the first acts of the capitalist rotors who usurped power was banning this book. 
One can then conclude that the Chinese party was one undergoing reforging in accordance with the Maoist approach, yet with a lot of unevenness in this very process. In fact, this new approach had developed by leading revolutionary practice, all the while ingesting new insights from its experiences. But it wouldn't be enough to mark this limit imposed by conditions. There is also the matter of an incomplete rupture from the common turn approach. Among them, the cult built up around Mao deserves special attention. This business of personality cult was initiated by Stalin in total opposition to Lenin's outlook. When the subsequent Soviet leader Khrushchev prepared ideological grounds for capitalist restoration by negating Stalin totally, under the guise of rejecting this cult, Mao took up the defense of Stalin. But this was done with Marxist criticism of Stalin's heirs, differentiating between what was to be adopted and what rejected. We need to think over whether this was complete. Personality cults can never be justified in Marxism, but instead of totally rejecting them, Mao limited himself to criticizing their extreme manifestations. Though some seek to justify this by appealing to complex situation of the class struggle in China, it is unacceptable in principle itself. The issue is not the extent of praise, or even whether somebody deserves to be praised. Such cults foster a consciousness of infallibility of an individual, a leadership and indirectly of that party, something rejected by the Maoist party concept but seen in the Chinese party's adjective, quote, always correct, unquote. Contemporary examples of Maoist parties justifying their leadership cults by citing Mao draw attention to the need to achieve clarity in this matter. In general, how far have the Maoists succeeded in rupturing from the common turnist party concept? How Maoist are the parties they are building up and leading? Though no one would theorize and thus legitimize a shift from staying with the masses and serving them to lording over them, this can already be seen in a number of instances. Blind faith in the party in the place of party loyalty centered on politics, blind belief in the infallibility of the leadership in cult worship, intolerance of opposition and criticism, pragmatism that sanctions any method if they are, quote, for the party and revolution, unquote. Such common turnist influences are commonly seen in methods of work and approach. The term common turnist is used because these were not heirs of Stalin alone. Moreover, they contain problems of a whole period in the history of the international communist movement. We must add, these were problems of an outlook and growth, because it was a time in which communist ideology was spread throughout the world, formation of communist parties was promoted, and a truly international revolutionary proletarian movement was given form. One of the great leaps achieved by Maoism is its rupture from bad traditions of the common turn period, without in the least minimizing its positive role. This must be further deepened. Today's Maoist parties are, without doubt, continuators of yesteryear communist parties, but their foundations must be the heights attained by Maoism and the vanguard concept, not the outlook or methods of their past. Rereading Marx on British India Much has already been written about Marx's writing on India. Is there need for more? Going by the introduction and appreciation seen in a new collection, the answer can only be an emphatic yes. Given the history of invasions of the Indian subcontinent by various forces and the empires they established, Marx raised an important question. What distinguished British rule from them? His answer was the civilizational, quote, superiority, unquote, of British colonialism. Superiority is a loaded term. Our contemporary critical sense, enriched by the insights of Edward Said and many others, calls for a closer look. But that cannot negate historical progress and the superior capabilities of any new social system compared to earlier ones. In all respects, including the appropriation of their knowledge. This was as true of the incorporation of tribal societies in the South Asian subcontinent into caste feudalism as it was for colonialism. The quote superior civilization unquote of the British was evidently a product of its capitalist nature, and in this respect the decisive difference noted by Marx, its inflicting a quote misery of an essentially different and infinitely more intensive kind unquote can't be denied. This refutes the charge of Orientalism and exposes a basic flaw in this whole stream of reading but that can't be a plea for avoiding critical reading itself. The fashion of blaming the faulty and biased source materials Marx had to rely on, and passing by an examination of how he used them or how they influenced him is certainly not Marxian. Marx was critical in his use of that material, but not completely so. This was influenced not only by the scarcity of additional inputs, but also by the Enlightenmentalist milieu of that period. Explicit traces of this influence can be seen, for example, in Marx's view on the Hindu religion, where he correctly criticizes it for subjecting humans, the sovereign of nature, to a brutalizing worship of nature. But this characterization of Hindu, properly speaking Brahmanic religion, also does great injustice to its sophisticated philosophical thinking. Besides, it misses the intriguing paradox of the existence of this high philosophy along with the animism in a single belief system. We can attribute this to faulty information. But can the supposedly sovereign role assigned to human beings avoid critical correction? It even violates Marx's own views on the nature of human metabolism. 
Yet another example is where he reasons that the state's running of irrigation systems in Asian countries, unlike private enterprise in medieval Europe, was necessitated by, quote, civilization being too low to call into life voluntary association, unquote, apart from the vastness of territory. Low in civilization, yet high enough to develop technology and organization for such enterprises? So what does this say about historical superiority? We need to be critical about the absolute quality usually vested in it. It has to be tempered with the recognition that what is surpassed as inferior may well contain some superior aspects. The relativeness of superiority to the future as well as to the past, given by class, gender, racial, and various other biases accompanying it, must never be ignored. Even a cursory reading of Marx's writing in the light of such new sensibilities would call for acknowledging such drawbacks. But sadly enough, this collection, edited by noted Marxist historians, has chosen to remain silent. Even worse, we see Prabhat, Potnayak, declaring those articles to be a, quote, real classic on Indian history, unquote. Some of Marx's views based on faulty sources, such as the concept of an Asiatic mode of production based on supposedly stagnant village communities and a despotic state, have been abandoned by most Marxist historians. The fact that even the hereditary divisions of labor, congealed in the caste order, correctly seen by Marx as a decisive impediment to progress, was itself never immobile, is now widely accepted. Similarly, his characterization of hand-spinning and hand-weaving as the pivots of village society, his view on the absence of private property and land, of the paralysis of productive forces for want of means of transport, of state functions as merely plunder in public works, irrigation, also stand corrected. Marx didn't know of the Harapan civilization, of the Mauryan or Guptan empires, by no means foreign, of the productive tasks prescribed for the state, by the Kautilya and its role in the expansion of settled agriculture, or of the locally developed technologies in agriculture and crafts. But we do and must therefore call into question Marx's opinion that British colonialism affected the, quote, greatest and only social revolution, unquote, in the subcontinent. To give it the halo of a classic view of our history would be making a laughingstock of Marxism and a departure from the creative advances made in applying it to the study of this subcontinent. D.D. Kosambi, a pioneer in this matter, observed, quote, The advance of agrarian village economy over tribal country is the first great social revolution in India, the change from an aggregate of gens to a society, unquote. Further, quote, Marx noted only the backwardness engendered by the caste system, the grip of the most disgusting rituals, which sickeningly degraded man. On the other hand, without these superstitions assimilated by Brahmanism at need, tribal society could not have been converted peacefully to new forms nor free savages changed into helpless serfs, unquote. Despite Kosambi's mistaken subscription to Marx's view that modern industry introduced by colonialism would dissolve caste, his erroneous characterization of the incorporation of tribal societies through the caste order as a more or less peaceful process and his overlooking the rituals and superstitions intrinsic to Brahmanism, these insights stand as valuable stepping stones. There is another matter. Take Prabhat Patnayak's trumpeting the, quote, lucidity of Marx's exposition of the dialectics of the colonial impact, unquote. Yes, Marx correctly drew attention to the dual role of British rule, its destructive and regenerative functions, but a careful reading of what he wrote, aided by knowledge of the actual course of developments, shows that this optimism about the regenerative role of colonialism was misplaced. Moreover, there was also the problem of viewing the prospects of colonial India through the prism of Western capitalism's course of development. One can summarize Marx's view as follows. Through the introduction of modern industry by way of the railways and of private property and land, through the Zamindari and Riotwari settlements, by the political unity enforced through colonial rule, formation of a native army and the growth of a new class, quote, endowed with requirements for government and imbued with European science, unquote, along with the introduction of a free press, the British were unconsciously laying the material foundations of Western or capitalist society. If we leave out the specificities, what stands out is a projection of an inevitable development of capitalism, more or less along the pattern witnessed in Western Europe. Furthermore, the role of force exerted by colonial political power was seen only in its transformative aspect, in breaking down the old framework. Its role as a barrier to the development of capitalism, as a protector of the old order, suitably reformed, was missed. So too was the distinct nature of the capitalism fostered by colonialism. It is surprising that Prabhat Patnayak ignored this in his appreciation, centered as it is on an exposition of a, quote, capitalist mode located in a midst of subjugated pre-capitalist hinterland, unquote, a necessary condition of imperialism, and by Ephraim Habib in his introduction. We will come back to this later. Let us first examine the central premise Marx drew on to arrive at his conclusions on the role of colonial political power and the dialectics of colonial rule. This was the destruction of handicraft, particularly of the weaving industry, by British commodity trade, 
in the introduction of modern industry, the dissolution of the existent natural economy. But the insight of later historical research shows that the period preceding the consolidation of British colonial rule saw large growth in the weaving sector and in cotton cultivation. It was stimulated by the new external demand created by colonial trade, as well as by a growth of the internal market. Some of the salient features of this development were the growing separation of handicrafts from agriculture, greater division of labor and specialization in the weaving sector, rapid growth of the weaver population in towns, and the emergence of a new weaver settlements. In view of this new knowledge, shouldn't a Marxist reflect on how, when, and why the population of Dhaka swelled to 150,000 largely weavers instead of remaining fixated on its drastic decline to 20,000 under British colonialism? Evidently, the dialectics of colonial intrusion was far more complex than destruction slash regeneration noted by Marx. Too much of indigenous capitalist development cannot be read into the facts recorded above. But it was also not a mere offshoot of colonial trade. At least in some parts of the subcontinent, the potential for capitalist development was emerging even before this. British colonialism did not impose its rule over a stagnant subcontinent, nor were the conditions it met those of a classical caste feudalism. Some regions in the subcontinent were already transitional. Moreover, there is no reason to insist that capitalism must develop only through internal stimuli. The case of Japan is illustrative. There, the forceful entry of Western colonial powers triggered an internal dynamic leading to the growth of capitalism. More importantly, the later loss of interest in Japan on the part of the colonial powers, drawn to the riches of China, gave it the favorable circumstance of avoiding colonial domination and thus allowed it to take the path of capitalist development. This brings us back to the role of political power. It wouldn't be off the mark to assume that indigenous capitalism could have developed in the Indian subcontinent under the strong stimuli of colonial and other trade. For example, Tepu Misuru, and to a lesser extent, Thiruvit Hamkor, and under Marthanda Varma, could have taken the trajectory of a development of capitalism from above through state intervention if they had remained independent. The consolidation of British colonial power was certainly one of the decisive factors preventing it. This implies a qualification of the regenerative role of British rule and draws attention to the dual role of colonial power. In the matter of regeneration, or the growth of capitalism, it was both transformative as well as suppressive. The various aspects noted by Marx no doubt led to the growth of capitalism, but of a certain type. It was shaped and worked by colonial interests, and this included the sustenance and regeneration of many elements of caste feudalism. This was later recognized by the Third International under Lenin and incorporated in its views on the colonial question. But a more precise characterization of this capitalism and the class engendered by it came through Mao Zedong's sparse but path-breaking illumination on bureaucrat capitalism and class analysis of the comprador bureaucrat bourgeoisie in China. It revealed a capitalism fostered by imperialism and intertwined with feudalism. These rich analytical tools have been totally ignored by most of the Marxist theoreticians in India. Prabhat Patnayak and Ephraim Habib are definitely of the view that colonialism, particularly imperialism, has obstructed the growth of capitalism. In his introduction, Ephraim Habib records this, but with a justification for Marx who, quote, naturally could not have foreseen how Britain would now use administrative measures to throttle India's industrial development, unquote. But why was this so natural? If the mill owners of Britain had blocked the sale of Indian textiles in an earlier period, they could surely be expected to employ colonial power to block the growth of a competing capitalism in the colony. Why did Marx miss this? The answer once again lies in his high expectations about the regenerative role of British rule and the consequent growth of capitalism in British India. He related this to the necessity felt by ascendant British industrial interests to create fresh productive powers after destroying local industry. This came about precisely because they found that the power to consume their goods in British India was contracting to the lowest possible point. Hence the conclusion, quote, you cannot continue to inundate a country with your manufacturers unless you enable it to give you some produce in return, unquote. Colonial power certainly did this enabling, but in a manner very different from what Marx expected. For a long period, the development of productive forces was mainly in the direction of ensuring raw materials for the industrial growth of Britain. The later growth of local industry was again a, quote, development of underdevelopment, unquote. What interests us here is the contradiction seen in Prabhat Patnayak's and Ephraim Habib's arguments. They've used the occasion of bringing out this new collection to introduce and argue the thesis that the exploitation of the colonies was not merely a matter of primary accumulation. There is a certain division of labor here. Potnayak visualizes Marx's articles as a window to enter the thesis, while Ephraim Habib devotes his efforts to substantiate Marx's prophecies with some inevitable amendments. But we will be justified in treating them as one because both of them accept the central argument of Marx's articles. Capitalist growth induced a stagnant society through the agency of colonial rule, 
Prabhat Patnayak has argued that Marx's articles, quote, see capitalism necessarily within a wider setting, not in isolation, but as existing amidst and coupled to pre-capitalist formations, which have been transformed by capitalism in accordance with its own needs through political domination in the form of colonial rule, unquote. The question is about the, quote, transformation, unquote, its nature and extent. As we saw earlier, Marx envisioned a development of capitalism due to the regenerative role of British rule. This was the basis for assuming a basic, if not total, transformation of pre-capitalist society in its future course under colonial rule. Ephraim Habib, favored by Potnayak for his, quote, illuminating introduction, unquote, would have us believe that Marx's predictions on a bourgeois class emerging and taking the lead of a national movement, an industry dissolving hereditary divisions of labor upon which the Indian caste rests, have been vindicated. He does recognize contradictions thrown up by British rule, but this is linked to his view that, quote, the genesis of modern elements in India under the aegis of British dominance cannot create any lasting groundwork for collaboration between the new classes and the British rulers, unquote. What he has in mind is not the proletariat or the new middle class, but the bourgeoisie itself. He seeks to substantiate this through Marx's observations on the poor response from Indian capitalists to the East India Company's loan. This is obviously a case of reading too much into the temporary hesitation shown by the local rich in the immediate context of the 1857 revolt. If we accept these views, then the finale of 1947 produced an independent country led by a bourgeoisie strong enough to throw off the yoke of imperialist colonialism. But if that were true, then there could be no reason to argue that a colonial relation, in one or another form, the exploitation of countries retained in backwardness, whatever its degree may be, is, quote, necessary, unquote, for capitalism or its highest stage of imperialism. On the contrary, if such exploitation is not merely a matter of primary accumulation, if it is a, quote, necessity, unquote, of capitalism and imperialism, we must then abandon the notion of gaining independence in 1947 and accept the bitter fact of a continued, though now semi-colonial, dependence. The reality of neocolonialism must be acknowledged. Marx noted, quote, The world market itself forms a basis for this mode of production. On the other hand, the imminent necessity of this mode of production to produce on an ever-enlarged scale tends to extend the world market continually, unquote. The greater part of this world market of capitalism was the colonies, and at present the semi-colonial countries. The exploitation and plunder of the colonies were crucial for the primary accumulation of the emerging capitalist mode. However, this was not just a matter of primary accumulation. It has also played a crucial role in the growth of capitalism into imperialism and its continued sustenance. This recognition does not eliminate the primary internal dynamics in the emergence of either capitalism or imperialism in the West, because a mode of production develops only where the conditions for it have taken shape. Neither does it shift the locus of exploitation to exchange relations instead of at the basic level of production. The issue for us is the conditions created and enforced by colonial rule, or the conditions sanctioned and imposed by imperialism in the post-colonial period. The continuous expansion of the world market necessitated by the capitalist mode of production in the metropolis demands the development of productive forces in the colonies. But the extent of this development depends on the exploitative needs of capital in the center. This makes subordination of the peripheries a must and also determines its nature. It is no doubt influenced and shaped by a number of other factors including class struggle and contradictions among world powers. But the element of oppression and disarticulation, which also contains the sustenance of semi-feudalism, is a constant. These conditions ruled out, and still rule out, the development of capitalism in these countries along the trajectory Marx projected. This takes us beyond Marx's article on British India and brings us to re-examining and developing the commonly accepted Leninist theory of imperialism. It is generally understood that the retrogressive role of colonialism was mainly a product of the shift of capitalism from progressive free trade to a reactionary monopoly phase. This does not accord with historical facts. The disarticulation of colonial economies and regeneration of feudal relations took place right from the very beginning of colonial rule during the phase of competitive capitalism. It was always a part of its transformative role, therefore what is needed is a synthesis, with Lenin's theory of imperialism at its core, but critically integrating the views of Rosa Luxemburg and of the World System School who have tried to address and situate the sustained rule of the colonial exploitative relations in the capitalist system. Such a synthesis must also necessarily include Mao Zedong's contributions, because they shed light on the particularities of capitalism promoted under the colonial relation, or at present under the form of neocolonialism. Sadly enough, the thesis sought to be advanced, explicitly by Prabhat, Patnayak, and implicitly by Ephraim Habib, is nowhere near this. Standing as they do on a political position that denies the colonial relation, the continued imperialist domination and control, 
shackling countries like India, Pat Nayak's argument about, quote, preservation of a subjugated and degraded pre-capitalist or semi-capitalist sector constituting the necessary environment within which the capitalist sector functions, unquote, falls lame. It amounts to nothing more than smuggling in elements of the world system school's argument in order to square the all-too-visible signs of imperialist domination and servility of their ruling classes, including among those they consider as communists, with their political positions on an, quote, independent, unquote, India, and an, quote, independent, unquote, big bourgeoisie. There could, of course, be another take of this thesis, whereby big industry in India is identified as the capitalist sector. But this would mean only a shifting of the problem and miserably fail to address the nature of India's relation to the imperialist centers. To come back to Marx's writing, the introduction of Ifran Habib and appreciation of Prabhat Patnayak are good lessons in how not to read Marx. Their concern to defend Marx is defeated by the glossing over of errors in recording history as well as in judgment. It is also marked by what can politely be put as convenient reading. Thus Ifran Habib declares that, quote, Marx's thesis of the union of agriculture and craft, and an immutable division of labor, as the twin pillars of the village economy, remains of lasting value, unquote. What Marx wrote about is the combination of the two circumstances bringing about a particular type of social system, the so-called village system. These were the central despotic state charged with taking care of public works like irrigation, and the dispersed existence of the populace, agglomerated in small centers by the domestic union of agricultural and manufacturing pursuits. This was supposed to be the characteristics of the Asiatic mode of production. If the mode as such is abandoned and the erroneous characterization of the role of the central state is corrected, what really remains of lasting value? The domestic union of agriculture and manufacture was something commonly seen in all medieval societies, east or west. What is unique is the hereditary division of labor, caste. It is to Marx's lasting credit that he drew attention to this feature and projected it as the decisive impediment to Indian progress and Indian power. How far has this insight, this truly unique feature, been taken up? How do we explain the hard fact that despite Marx's acknowledging caste as a division of labor, and Bedkar's insight on caste also as a division of laborers, and Kosambi's pioneering work on the role of the caste order in the incorporation of tribal societies into feudalism, the tradition in Indian Marxist thought, and political practice, has been to see it as a matter of the superstructure? How far can all these questions be addressed by those who declare that the Indian working class has more or less dissolved caste, even when all facts of their life point to the opposite? Despite all the limitations and even errors in Marx's writings, what stands out is his effort to apply materialism in the study of the history and society of the Indian subcontinent, paying keen attention to what he then knew as its particularities. It is this approach that needs to be distilled and applied in our historical studies, and it should be tempered with Kosambi's observation. Quote, India is not a mathematical point, but a very large country, a subcontinent with the utmost diversity of natural environment, language, historical course of development. Neither in the means of production nor in the stages of social development was there overall homogeneity in the oldest times. Centuries must be allowed to pass before comparable stages of productive and social relationships may be established between the Indus Valley, Bengal, and Malabar. Even then, important difference remains, which makes periodization for India as a whole almost impossible, except with the broadest margins, unquote. The Politics of Liberation The very fact that the continued existence of caste oppression in Kuralam has to be reasserted today is a good indication of these times. Our rulers have yet to come out with claims of having ended the evils of caste. Yet the way is being opened for them by some intellectuals who can get an audience, since they are widely regarded as progressives. For the time being, this argument is limited to the Dalit question. It is really impossible to present such an argument today about the Adivasi question, given the repeated reports of their deprivation and oppression. But we can expect something similar soon on the women question, with a rollout of data on how they have been, quote, empowered, unquote, through posts in the local bodies and self-help groups. More importantly, more than just the Dalit question, the views introduced by these intellectuals represent a plea that specific issues of social oppression are insignificant when compared to getting on with the, quote, progress, unquote, we have already made. In its essence, it is similar to the justifications trotted out for globalization, where the need to catch up and move ahead in the 21st century was deployed to curb resistance and criticism of the devastation it caused. Social Oppression and Discrimination As we stated in the beginning, there is a need today to reassert the facts of social oppression. Apart from some recounting of facts, the very method used for assessment must be settled. Those who demand a rethink on caste reservation 
based it on a comparison of Dalits in Kuralam with those in other parts of the country. They state that since Kuralam has progressed far in social indicators and awareness, it would be retrogressive to speak of caste oppression here. But this very argument contradicts their conclusion. If Kuralam has progressed, then the logical thing to do is to compare the situation of Dalits with other castes in Kuralam as a whole. And if we do this, we can easily see that they stand well below the average in assets, education, and employment opportunities, while their social vulnerability is quite high. This is true for Adivasis and women too. The Dalit castes were traditionally linked to agriculture. Though Dalits are no longer a majority in the agrarian workforce, caste-wise they are still the largest section, yet 95% are practically landless. All that the land reforms gave them was homestead land. By doing this, it also effectively excluded them from any further right to land other than surplus land. Even worse, it has instilled the thinking that they no longer have any right to the land of landlords and others since their private property is sanctified by land reform legislations. Various studies showed that the Dalits remain at the bottommost level of society. In education, though schooling is common, their dropout rate is higher than average. It increases at each higher level. Earlier, most of those continuing used to reach at least the pre-degree plus two level. Now this is also falling as the expenses of education go up and their due stipends are kept pending. Though a lot is made of bank loans and government support for those getting admission in the so-called self-reliant colleges, the hard truth was brought out by the horror of Rajani's suicide. A Dalit student who had somehow managed to get into a private engineering college, but found it impossible to continue because of the cost. As for employment, except for the few who have gotten into government service or public enterprises through reservation, the vast majority are daily wage workers in agriculture, loading, construction, road laying, workshops, commercial establishments, and in the growing sectors of security and home nursing. It would take a lot of social blindness to deny that this miserable condition is a result of caste oppression. At the other end, Savarna castes of all religions still have a share in assets, particularly land, far disproportionate to their share in population. Though the Azhavas have gained, it is limited to the upper section. The majority still remain land poor. In the bureaucracy, the top posts are still manned by Savarnas. As reported by the Narendran Commission, among the quote backward castes unquote, only the Azhavas have managed to get their due share in reservation. Christian Dalits, Muslims, and Devaras in that order are way behind. Even among Dalits and Adivasis, only a few castes and tribes have gained through reservation. In a replication of the caste order, there is overrepresentation of a high degree in the lowest manual jobs, category D, and underrepresentation at the top level. Caste oppression and discrimination continue to exist at the level of social intercourse. While explicit forms like untouchability and forced menial labor are uncommon, they have by no means ended. They still exist in certain regions of Kasaragod and Palaka districts. Caste severely restricts social intercourse, whether it is personal or neighborhood friendships and relations, throughout this so-called enlightened state. While inter-caste marriages have increased, they still face family and social opposition. C. Iapon observes, quote, Today caste is subtle, complex, invisible, and extremely anti-human. There is no difficulty in walking on public streets, entering temples, or throwing money into the temple hundi. But caste becomes decisive when sharing cooked food, seeking out a mate from the opposite sex, and sharing power, unquote. In culture, traditional Dalit expressions are treated as exhibits but never considered as important contributors to the Malayali's cultural progress. The dominant view in folklore studies places such expressions as imitations of Brahmanic forms quite in keeping with the inverted logic of the Natya Sastra. Incidents of physical oppression are not that uncommon, though often widely unreported or presented in a manner where the caste dimension is covered up. Police hounding of Dalit youth is quite the norm in areas where the Dalit population is concentrated. The situation of the Adivasis is even worse. Historically, roughly 40% of the Adivasis were landless, Adiyalars, or food gatherers. The rest were peasants with their own land. But this has changed and the number of landless has increased. This deterioration started with the plantation economy introduced by colonialism. It is continued by Malayali ethnic oppression. The viciousness of this is sharply seen in the way the Adivasis were, and are, denied even their legal land rights by the UDF, LDF, and the courts not to speak of its forcible seizure by Malayali migrants. Though some partial relief has been obtained through the Adivasi land struggles, the problem remains. Apart from this economic deprivation, Adivasis face cultural oppression and discrimination in various forms. Their culture face extinction and are being reduced to mere museum objects, while national minorities in Kralam, like the Tamilians and Kanadigas, enjoy the right to be educated in their mother tongue, 
Adivasi children are forced to study in Malayala medium. There is one major reason for the heavy dropout rate among Adivasi children. The cultural imposition is justified by false science that declares that all Adivasi languages to be dialects of Malayalam. Over the years, this will lead to the extinction of these languages and their rich vocal literature. As a social section, Adivasi women are the most vulnerable to sexual exploitation. Nothing is effectively done to tackle this since its roots are in Malayali ethnic oppression and cultural stereotyping of the Adivasis are not identified. As for violence against Adivasis, the truth of so-called Malayali tolerance was seen in the post-Muthanga Adivasi hunt in Wayanad in 2003. Any Adivasi was open game to be rounded up in streets or pulled off buses and attacked. Let us also not forget that though this was a concentrated expression of social violence against Adivasis, it is by no means an isolated one. Every year, on an average, nearly 40 to 50 Adivasis, mainly women, are killed, with Adipati in the Palaka district leading. Coming to the status of women, it is true that their condition is better in sectors like health and education compared to other states. The earlier forms of naked oppression have more or less been eliminated. But on a closer look, various examples of sharp gender discrimination can be seen. With the strengthening of patrilineage, the desire to have boys has increased. The share of girls in the sex ratio among children below 6 years old has gone down a considerable extent. Female photicide has arrived in Kuralam as well. Though girls are well represented in education, they are still rare in technical fields. Higher education is still gender stereotyped. This stereotyping begins from childhood. Though women of the bottommost classes and castes enjoy greater freedom, male chauvinism is rampant in all sections of society. In recent years, sexual attacks and exploitation of women have taken a quantum jump. The majority of the working women in Kralam are employed in low-paid daily wage work in sectors like quarter, cashew, beady, handloom weaving, seafood processing, shops, and cleaning. The growing share of fallow land and decline in paddy cultivation has led to a steep fall in their employment opportunities. In modern sectors also, such as electronics, textiles, and hospitals, most of them are casual workers with low wages and poor service conditions. Some Lessons from the Past to understand the dimensions of continuing social oppression and discrimination in contemporary Kuralam, we must take a critical look at what is called the Renaissance or modernization of the early 20th century. The social ferment of the early 20th century is often treated as an example of capitalist renaissance, which broke down age-old caste feudal society and modernized Kuralam. A variant of this theme accepts that feudalism has ended and what we have now is a democratic society, though caste still remains. At the other end, particularly today, when the evils of the past revisit and remind us that they are still alive and kicking, that period of transformation is mainly dismissed as a gross betrayal. What is common to all these views is their failure to situate those political, social, and economic movements in the correctness of that historical period, namely colonialism. Imperialism in the form of colonialism did indeed transform caste feudalism, but it was not interested in destroying it. The specific type of capitalism, bureaucrat capitalism, it introduced was indissolubly linked to caste feudalism. In other words, colonial modernization had a dual, contradictory role. While colonial modernity swept away many cobwebs of the past, it also polished up and restored a number of antiquated stuff. All the old social movements that emerged in that context were afflicted by this duality. They tried to seize the opportunities provided by colonial modernization, even while they internalized the limits imposed by that very social process. Within this, we must distinguish between two broad streams, which may be broadly termed as the Savarna and the Avarna streams. The Savarna stream, too, had its share in democratization. But the oppressor status of the Savarna did not demand anything more than a reform of rituals, relations, and institutions, including family, that hampered the traditional rich and emerging middle class from availing of the new opportunities offered by colonial transformation. Beyond that, caste was not a burden, but a useful social relation for their advance. On the contrary, the Avarna stream could not but challenge the caste order itself. Any gaining class status would become of social value only through this. The predicament of Alamutul Chanar, the highest taxpayer, in Thirut Thavamkur was a sharp revelation of the task confronting the Avarna stream. He was able to employ a Nair, Savarna driver, for his car, yet when passing a temple he was forced to get out and take a walking detour. Meanwhile, his driver, unpolluted, would drive right across to wait for his employer. This difference was also manifested in the manner in which the two streams posed their demands. For the Savarna stream, it was a matter of individual and class demands against caste. But the Avarna stream could not but raise caste demands to satisfy similar needs. 
At the superficial level, the former could thus lay a claim on contemporariness, modernity, and even progressiveness, this despite being limited to reforms within the traditional caste order. Contrary to this, the Avarna stream, operating through the historically outmoded category of caste, seemed to be stuck in the old rut, even though it was really addressing the task of radical democratization. Of course, we must keep in mind that what is outlined above is the objective dynamics of these two streams, whatever may have been the subjective perceptions. Why is it necessary to stress this demarcation? First, though Narayana Guru, Sahadaran Ayapan, more recently, Ayankali, and Poki Yul Johanan, and rarely, Vaikuntha Swami are held up as standard bearers of Kuralam's modernization by official historians. They are grouped with various Savarna reformers, thereby diluting their true role. Second, the formal approach that fails to link democratization with the struggle against caste is still influential and is still able to maintain its pretense of progressiveness. The fact that people can easily pass off the opinion that caste remains part of social discourse only because some intellectuals keep writing about it, or the fact that the casteist outlook of Sri Raman's short story, Duravasta Vindam Vanapool, is being presented as a glowing example of class stand and a milestone in progressive literature, reminds us of this. Moreover, distinguishing between the Savarna and Avarna streams is also necessary to properly assess the role of the communist movement in the making of contemporary Kralam. But before we deal with that, let us first examine the limits of the Avarna stream. The Vaikuntha Swami movement, Sri Narayana Dharma, Paraplana Sangam, Sadhujana, Paraplana Sangam, and Ayankali Pada, Pratyaksha Raksha, Daivasaba, and the Saihodara Prasthanam, were the more prominent movements in the Arvana stream. They were inspired or initiated by Aya Vaikuntha Swami, Narayana Guru, Ayankali, Poikayol Johanan, and Ayapan, respectively. Each of them objectively posed the task of annihilating caste, some through their radical views, some through the new, casteless communities they tried to establish. Above all, this radical character defines their historical contribution to the advance of Malayali society. In a feudal society, bourgeoisie views or bourgeois democracy are by no means bad things. They are the historically appointed leaders of social revolution. In a caste feudal society, to be true to its historical task, bourgeois democracy must engage with the task of annihilating caste, overturning the caste order. The merit of the movements mentioned above lies in their dealing with this task, unlike the Savarna stream, with its formal symbols of modernity. Yet none of these movements could relate caste annihilation to the destruction of feudalism and imperialism. Except for Vaikuntha Swami, none of them identified colonial domination as an enemy or the nexus between the colonial power and the Savarna royalty's rule. Bourgeois democracy inevitably fails when colonial domination protects caste feudalism, even while transforming it. It cannot even identify the true nature or limits imposed by a modernization taking place under colonial domination. This is because of its bourgeois class content. Even when genuine bourgeois democracy in an oppressed country stands against feudalism and imperialism, the capitalist class essence it shares with the colonial oppressor prevents it from repeating, even in its thinking, the revolutionary thrust of a bourgeois renaissance. No doubt the opportunities, endowments, and hence capacities of the early 20th century movements in Kralam were quite varied because of their positions in the class and caste order. But that does not deny the ultimately bourgeois limit of their views or its centrality in restricting their practical aims. Only Sahodar and Ayapan could come close to surpassing this, ideologically as well as practically, by pursuing rationalism, addressing the issues faced by the emerging modern working class, and recognizing the historical significance of the Russian Revolution. This was the immediate context of the budding working class movement in Kralim. Its historical roots lay in the Avarna stream. In fact, its first organizer, Bhava Mupan, was inspired by Narayana Guru, and so were his recruits. How did the emerging communist movement synthesize this? The new class, the proletariat, generated by the combined exploitation of imperialism, caste, feudalism, and local capitalism, could have overcome the drawbacks of the Avarna stream. Unlike other classes, this one alone had the living experience of all types of exploitation and oppression. It also had the potential capacity to take up Marxist ideology, which could give an all-around view of society and link up all the streams of democratic and national awakening into a revolutionary assault on the old society, but that didn't happen. The Communist Party leadership had to lead the proletariat in this task, repeated the old story of partial vision and partial opposition, now wrapped up in Marxist terminology. It is very important to grasp this and go beyond a simplistic criticism that reduces the whole question to the betrayal of Dalits by the Communist Party or the limitations of Marxism as a theory in dealing with issues like caste. 
First of all, not just the Dalits, but all the exploited were betrayed by the undivided CPI when it denigrated to outright collaboration with the existing state in the 1950s. Besides, though Marxist classics have not written much about caste, they do insist on a concrete analysis of the concrete situation and solidarity with the movements of the oppressed. When the CPI leader, S.A. Deng, met with the Russian party leaders in 1947, one of the questions put to him by Zdanov was about the caste question and what the CPI was doing about it. What needs to be stressed is that the communist movements failed to distinguish between the Avarna and Savarna streams, synthesize their contributions, and firmly place itself as the continuator of the Avarna democratic stream, even while struggling to establish a proletarian class outlook as opposed to a caste outlook. Though the Communist Party organized and led many struggles on social and economic issues faced by the Dalits and other oppressed sections, and though this contributed to their social and political awakening and economic betterment, it failed to develop a revolutionary theory and practice that addressed the specificities of such issues. This, of course, must be seen in the context of its overall failure to develop a revolutionary program and take up the struggle to seize political power. The leading core was forever anchored in the Savarna, more specifically, Gandhian tradition. A good example of this in relation to the caste question was the comparison made by EMS Nambudirapad between Kumarana San and Valathal. Valathal was held to be a national poet since he, unlike Hassan, dealt with the freedom struggle and the new workers' movement apart from other social issues. But where did he stand with regard to the caste order lying at the very core of the social system? For EMS, this was not an issue, since Valathal was sympathetic to the Gandhian Savarna reform theme. Seen historically, Valathal's adherence to this theme was actually a retrogressive step, particularly in Kuralam, where the Avarna stream had already taken up the task of caste annihilation. Not surprisingly, while EMS gave a detailed account of the new movements that informed Valathal's poetic impulses, he was silent about the anti-caste movements that contributed to genuine democratic thought and paved the way for the working class movement. The failure to synthesize the Arvana democratic tradition was compounded by a mechanical, economist grasp and application of Marxism. The leaders of the undivided CPI placed caste in the superstructure, ignoring its all-too-visible role in the relations of production. Though they formally adopted the agrarian revolution as the axis of the National Democratic Revolution, the old undivided CPI and later the CPM or CPI never addressed this particular feature of caste feudalism. It never found a place in their theoretical work or agrarian programs. The slogan of land to the tiller was grasped and applied in a mechanical, economist manner, ignoring the issue of identifying the real tillers, a position exclusively reserved for the tenants, thereby Dalit landless peasants' right to the land they tilled was denied. They were excluded from the peasant movement by channeling them into agricultural laborers' organizations. These were focused on wages and working conditions in homestead or surplus land. Even where they gained land through homestead rights or distribution of surplus land under CPI or CPM-led governments, this blocked them from any further right to land. In effect, this was a modified continuation of the Brahmanic exclusion of Dalits from the right to land and an inevitable consequence of the programmatic positions of these parties. In the realm of ideology, though there were few exceptions, in general the party did not develop an all-around critique of Brahmanism. Instead, leading figures like Donj and EMS were keen to uphold the Brahmanic tradition in reactionaries like Sankara. EMS is extolling the caste order as a great contribution of Aryan Brahmins, and declaring that there would not have been a Kerala culture without it is a notorious example of the vulgar Marxism followed by the undivided CPI. This has continued today in the approaches of the CPM and CPI on the struggle against Savarna fascism and on caste reservation. They fail to relate the reflourishing of Savarna values with the still existent, though partially transformed, caste feudalism. Instead of attacking Brahmanism, they try to compete with Savarna fascists by claiming the moderate Brahmanic standards of Vivekananda, Gandhi, and similar other Savarna reformers. The recent instance of a top CPM leader in West Bengal, declaring that he is first a Brahmin, then a Hindu, and then only a communist, and the mild way this was dealt with by that party central leadership, speaks volumes about its outlook. We thus understand that the continued existence of caste and other forms of social oppression and discrimination, the continuing domination of Brahminic values in all aspects of society, despite the social ferment created by the movements of the past, invariably expose the limitations and failures of those movements themselves. What took place here was not a thoroughgoing renaissance, but its faint shadow. Our modernization was by no means a capitalist one, but an outcome of the partial transformation of caste feudal society by imperialist colonialism. The rereading of our past by Dalit, feminist, Adivasi activists, and intellectuals 
have yielded many new insights that question the pretensions of Malayali enlightenment. Yet, since modernization is taken as a given fact, since the basic premise of those who benefit from the existing state of affairs is accepted, they internalize crucial elements of the oppressor's logic. We will now get into this. Identity Politics In recent years, identity politics has become influential among socially oppressed sections of society. It would be wrong to dismiss this as an external influence or imperialist plot. No doubt the impact of black, women's, and indigenous people's movements abroad have exerted influence. But identity politics has always been present, though not presented as such. And yes, imperialist agencies are making special efforts to promote this politic through NGOs and other means. However, the opportunities they get for this, as well as the fact that they could make headway, are in itself proof that the matter cannot be dismissed as a conspiracy. There is a material basis for identity politics, which is why, regardless of whether imperialism conspires or not, it has an audience. When a section of people suffer oppression, disadvantage, discrimination, or economic deprivation, precisely because they are differentiated by race, color, caste, ethnicity, gender, religion, or nationality, that collective experience inevitably constructs a distinct identity by which they are marked and are forced to mark themselves. For a Marxist who understands that social consciousness is determined by social existence, this is quite evident. And that is not the issue of difference with the proponents of identity politics. In real life, social existence and social identity is an ensemble of social relations. It cannot be reduced to any one of them alone. To give an example, the identity of a person as Dalit, Adivasi, or woman is itself an ensemble of social relations. In the case of a Dalit, it is a construct of the social relations of not only caste, but of religion, nationality, gender, and class. But Dalit identity politics, to be true to itself, must reduce this to the single aspect of caste. This is the same with any other identity politics. A quest for emancipation guided by identity politics is invariably limited by this inherent disadvantage. Subjectively, identity politics may claim to address various facets of social existence, but a subjective program of emancipation can never address the complex needs of emancipation of the oppressed. For a landless Adivasi woman, it is not enough to be emancipated from gender discrimination. She must also gain emancipation from ethnic oppression and class exploitation. Can the pluralist argument being advanced today overcome this? No. Let us first eliminate the absurd notion of plurality between the oppressors and oppressed. This can never exist other than as an oppressive relation. And in that case, it is by no means a plurality. If we remove this from consideration, then what remains is the plurality of various oppressed social groups or sections. But this is not an answer to the disadvantage pointed above. This is plurality among social groups, not within them. Take the example of a landless Adivasi woman given above. We can separate the various, or if you want plural, social relations she is a part of for purpose of analysis. In her life, they are one. She lives and experiences them as a single whole. Her demand is for emancipation from all of it. Pluralism cannot satisfy this demand. Moreover, identity consciousness, even when taken from one side only, such as Dalit, Adivasi, and so on, divides into two. There is on the one side the consciousness of the oppressed against the oppressor. It includes self-respect, the conscious struggle against any sense of inferiority and inability. This is a powerful factor in any social revolution. On the other hand, so long as this consciousness is restricted to the confines of that distinct identity, it inevitably remains within parameters set by the oppressors. No matter how radical that politics is, the internalization of the oppressor's outlook, in one way or another, becomes unavoidable. For example, though Dawit consciousness can confront caste oppression, that consciousness cannot but be tainted by caste because it has to pit caste against caste. This remains true even when its political position makes caste annihilation a central issue. Since the present caste order serves not just oppressor caste interests, but also those of imperialism and bureaucrat capitalism, caste annihilation cannot be attained merely by fighting against caste oppression. When this is sought to be overcome either by working at a position that addresses all of this, or by defining the Dalits to encompass all the oppressed, it inevitably conflicts with the consciousness it's based on. The experience of the Dalit Panther movement, of Maharashtra in the late 1960s and early 1970s, or the DSS, and Karanataka are examples of this. Though identity politics of any form may subjectively believe it represents the interests of the most exploited sections, its class essence is invariably petite bourgeois or bourgeois. This flows from the reformism inherent to it. In specific historical contexts, this can play a radical role, but in the long-term perspective of total emancipation, it becomes an obstacle. 
Finally, it must be pointed out that many of the identity politics trends seen today represent a retrogression from the radical positions of caste annihilation, women's liberation, and out of Aussie liberation of the past. We will now examine some of these concepts. On the Dalit question, even while swearing by Dr. Ambedkar, Samudayam, or community formation, is posed by some in place of caste annihilation. The process by which numerous sub-castes transformed into present, Nair, or as Hava Samudayams, is taken as the model to emulate. Though the argument that Samudayam is not caste has been advanced, it is quite clear that it is nothing other than a reorganization of the caste order. Regardless of whether the socioeconomic position of the Dalit castes allow formation of a single Samudayam, or as some argue Christian and Hindu Dalit Samudayams, will it make any basic change in caste oppression? Numbers by themselves are not going to do this. There are a number of states where the Dalit population is 25% or even more, is less fragmented into different castes and is organized, but that hasn't liberated them. Some Samudayam proponents argue that the bigger grouping of Samudayam will bring voting clout that can be used to improve the Dalit's economic position. Creation of a vote bank can certainly help in bargaining, but experience shows that the benefits will only go to a tiny minority, while the majority will not only remain deprived, but more tied down to the existing social system. Even if a separate party that operates within the constitution of the present oppressive system is formed, it can only become yet one more collaborator of the ruling classes. It will mainly benefit a section of leaders to gain entrance into bureaucratic capitalism. This was the hard lesson of the Republican Party of India's degeneration that inspired the revolt against it in the 1960s and the formation of the Dalit Panther movement in Maharashtra. While the term Dalit, popularized by the Panthers, has been taken up, the lesson of their revolt is conveniently forgotten. The RPI history now repeats itself in the BSP. Besides this, to take the example of the Eshavas, for all the numbers, vote bank, and assets of the Sri Narayana Dharma, Paraplana Sangam, SNDP, the poor among them are still poor. Though they have the advantage of their caste position, this has not emancipated them from the oppressiveness of the existing system. To attribute the comparatively better position of the Eshavas, mainly to their coalescing into a single Samadayam, is to forget the existence of landlords and other rich sections among them. Their historical position in the caste order that allowed their upper crust to take advantage of opportunities given by colonialism, and above all, the leap in social consciousness achieved through the Narayana Guru, Sahodaran Ayapan movements, and the Communist movement. While the Dalits had similar attributes in the Ayankali, Poikayil Johannin movements and the communist movement, their position at the bottommost level of the caste order and class position far outweighed them. Like all their oppressed at the lowest rungs of any society, their emancipation demands a total destruction of the exploitative social system. This was not on the agenda of the past movements, including the communist movement. Another trend is that of Dalit nationality. The proposal to conceive the Dalits as a distinct nationality argues for abandoning the classical Marxist definition of nationality. It states that the common experience of social oppression and economic status is sufficient to consider the Dalits as a pan-Indian nationality. Let us keep aside the objective validity of such a concept and its criticism on the Marxist nationality concept for the time being. All the Dalit castes in India, even historically, did not have a common economic status, though all of them were at the lowest rung of caste feudalism and denied any right to land. And in the present period, class differentiation, mainly to a petite bourgeoisie and landless peasants, is obvious. But this may be explained as similar to the existence of classes in any nationality. Let us accept this for argument's sake, though the premise of a common economic status is lost. What is the implication of this nationality concept? By its logic, the Brahmins, or the Savarnas as a whole, should also be considered as a nationality, in this case united by the common experience of social advantage through caste oppression. The practical political relevance of the Dalit nationality position should be the struggle for the right of self-determination. Should this right be accorded to the Brahmins or Savarnas and others? This is a pertinent question because the proponents of Dalit nationality usually link it to the demand for a rightful share of political power and economic resources. We will get into this matter later on. The point to stress here is that this concept abandons the task of caste annihilation by its very logic. To come back to the question of the Marxist definition of nationality, it will be useful here to recollect the Third Communist International's common turn position on the black nation in the USA and its right of self-determination, including secession. This was developed in the 1930s under the leadership of Stalin, an acknowledged Marxist authority on the national question. What was the materialist basis for this position? It was the fact that the blacks, forcibly brought as slaves to the southern states of the USA, had emerged as a nationality, despite coming from different tribes and regions of Africa, acquiring a common language, English, 
culture, and psyche through the common experiences of slavery. In the period when this position was adopted by the blacks of USA, were overwhelmingly concentrated in the southern states and were mainly sharecroppers. This provided the material basis for raising the rights of secession. It must be stressed that the implementation of this position demanded the destruction of the imperialist social system in America as a precondition. This position created a very powerful impact, not only among the blacks, but also within the whole American communist movement. It is notable that the common turn and genuine communist in the American party had to continuously fight against the revisionists within the party to establish and take up this position. It was later dropped when the revisionists under Browder seized leadership of the party. The lesson this gives is that the Marxist concept of nationality is by no means an iron-bound mold. If it is applied in line with the Marxist outlook, it is quite capable of grasping society in its motion. Identity politics has also given rise to a trend of idolizing tribal customs, rituals, and ways of life and demanding tribal autonomy as a solution. This trend is strikingly blind to history in the present. One of its premises is the vision of a peaceful, democratic tribal society that was overthrown by Brahminic forces. Brahminic forces certainly destroyed and forcibly incorporated tribal societies, but tribal societies were by no means free of violence and oppression. One doesn't have to consult historical texts to learn this. It is well known that some tribes in Kuralam were utilized as adialars by other tribes who were more socially advanced. Another characteristic of this trend is the ignoring of class differences within tribes and of historically given differences in the economic status among tribes. As a result, its politics of tribal confederation has ended up as yet one more variant, and that too a weak one, of vote bank politics. Cultural domination is one of the concrete manifestations of ethnic oppression but the struggle against this cannot be posed as a return to some pure tribal state. This is not only impossible, but it also ignores the necessity to reform outdated, particularly anti-woman, tribal customs. The Adivasi tribes cannot but be influenced by changes taking place around them. The dominating influence, inevitably that of the oppressors, is one of degeneration and undermining. But all influences are not like this. For example, the surpassing of traditional Mupons, who were in fact a link in the chain of caste feudal authority, by modern organizational forms is certainly a step forward. No society or people can stand still. But the development of tribal peoples cannot mean the wiping out of their unique customs and their replacement by those of the surrounding people, though they may be historically more advanced. The reform and further development of customs and ways of life is something that must be carried out by the tribal peoples themselves. Only then can they advance as a people with self-awareness. This is the essence of a scientific position on tribal autonomy. Needless to say, this cannot be realized within the present social system or its constitution. The tribal scheduled areas in northeastern states and others give ample proof. In keeping with the needs of imperialist globalization and the recasting of ruling class legitimacy, the ruling classes have been promoting affirmative action as an alternative to caste reservation. The most concrete manifestation of this was the Bhopal Declaration promoted by the Indian National Congress. The Bhopal Declaration is part of the concerted attack on caste reservation via anti-reservation agitations, pseudo-objective scholarly essays on the need to expand the criterion of reservation by including all sorts of other aspects of backwardness and the promotion of Savarna interests under the guise of merit. The Bhopal Declaration calls for allotting a certain quota in government orders for products and services in favor of enterprises of Dalits, Adivasis, and backward castes. The response of the educational and corporate elite to the recent proposal on implementing reservation in their sectors is also shaping up along these lines. Scholarships in a quota system and procurement are being held out as alternatives to reservation. This apparently offers equal opportunity to members of the oppressed caste, provided they have sufficient merit or entrepreneurial skill. There lies the catch. Centuries-old shackles of caste effectively prevent the large majority of the oppressed caste from acquiring knowledge and skills more easily obtained by others. Even in the most liberal circumstances, they must confront bias and discrimination, which continuously wear them down. Those who manage to surmount this will inevitably be a tiny minority. If this capacity to overcome is to be made the criteria, in place of the right of all members of the oppressed caste to reservation in education and jobs, with concessions and admission, and promotion qualifications and loan quotas, ultimately their vast majority is going to be cut off from any means to improve their situation. Yet this reactionary proposal has gained support from some well-known Dalit and Adivasi intellectuals and activists. This emerges from their limited vision of striking a deal with the existing social setup and a misplaced belief that the dynamics of globalization can be used for this. In the final analysis, it is yet another instance of the reformist quest of identity politics for a share in political power and resources. 
The political demands of identity politics in the women's question are comparatively less concrete in Kerala, though it is an influential trend in feminist thinking. What exists prominently is the attraction of a number of feminists to the empowerment trap of the ruling classes. The very concept of empowerment denies the harsh fact of gender oppression and exploitation. In its view, the miserable condition of women is only due to the lack of capacities, opportunities, and resources, and the solution is to give these to them. The ruling classes are trying to recruit politically and socially advanced women from among the exploited and middle classes into becoming their willing tools by giving them posts in the local bodies. The self-help groups, like Ayalkutam and Kudambasri, have a similar role. Women are diverted from the real issues responsible for their misery, such as gender discrimination and wages, landlessness, male irresponsibility, and caste oppression. They are forced to believe that their only problem is a lack of saving habits. The traditional saving methods that women had developed are belittled in the grip of bureaucrat capitalism and their families is tightened through links with the state and financial institutions. Quite often these groups are directly utilized by the state to carry out anti-people policies and surveillance. All of this is either ignored or downplayed by feminist supporters of empowerment. All they see is the organizing of women. This is a short-sighted approach. Women are being organized against their real interests by the state. Inevitably, this will only become an obstacle for their emancipation. We earlier mentioned the demand for a rightful share of political power and economic resources. Whether in the form of a Dalit Samudayam, or nationality demanding this right, of tribal autonomy, or of empowerment of women, this demand is common to various trends of identity politics. The demand of the oppressed for representation in political power and participation in the control and use of resources is just, but it should be posed not as a share, but as equal participation in political power in all realms of society. First, the oppressed and exploited need the whole world, not just a share. Linked to this is the second thing, share in which power and which economy. As it stands, the demands being raised today are for a share in the existing political system and economy. This is certainly not what the exploited and oppressed need. It can benefit only from those who crave to join the ranks of the exploiters. This is reformism in collaboration with the exploiters and oppressors. In a society where there are socially disadvantaged sections, its revolutionary transformation must address their specific issues, particularly their social exclusion and oppression. The new state and society must incorporate special policies and structures for this. The new power established in the revolutionary base areas of Nepal and the proposals put forward by the Communist Party of Nepal, Maoist, on necessary representation of socially oppressed groups in a constituent assembly and in the new state were bold in new steps in this direction. Within the liberated areas, seven tribal autonomous governments were formed. In regions where Dalits are present, their representation in the new power was ensured by the constitutional provisions of the new revolutionary power. Similarly, women's representation was ensured at all levels of power. This was also done in the distribution of economic resources. We can compare this foundation laying of a new society achieved through a 10-year-long people's war with the South African experience. In South Africa, the transfer of power to the African National Congress, or ANC, under Nelson Mandela, was acclaimed as a new model of addressing issues of social oppression and discrimination, in this case the blacks and others who had suffered from apartheid. But the old exploitative state and social system were left intact because of the surrender of the ANC leadership in exchange for a share in it. Though apartheid has ended formally, the vast majority of blacks still continue to suffer discrimination in a miserable life. This is the lesson of real life. Politics of Class Struggle If identity politics cannot be a guide for total liberation, where should we turn to? We must return to class struggle led by proletarian ideology, Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, or MLM. The word return is purposely used since, for some time now, an exclusion of MLM from any role in guiding the resolution of social oppression and discrimination has become quite fashionable. This view is based on a one-sided evaluation of the past. One such theme is the betrayal of the Dalits by the communist movement, which we dealt with earlier. Yet another theme argues that though feudalism has been eliminated, caste remains. It then uses this as quote proof unquote to assert that class struggle cannot achieve caste annihilation. In a similar manner, the failure of the old communist movement and of the new Maoist movement for a long period to develop a correct perspective on the women's question is coupled with a one-sided reading of experiences in the erstwhile socialist countries to argue that class analysis and struggle cannot guide women's liberation. We have already examined the positive and negative role of the class struggle led by the old communist movement. In the present context, a striking and common feature of all those who deny the centrality of class struggle must be pointed out here. They exclude any examination of the failure of the old communist movement to apply Marxism in a creative manner. They refuse to acknowledge the degeneration of this movement into revisionism and collaboration with the ruling classes, 
following the turn of parliamentarism in the early 1950s. Thus, all the evils of mechanical, economist thinking, and revisionism are conveniently attributed to Marxism as an easy way to justify turning away from the challenging task of carrying out revolutionary transformation. Theoretically, caste, gender, and ethnicity are declared as non-class categories, which cannot be dealt with by class analysis. Marxism is accused of class or economic reductionism. This view has received a boost with the postmodernist critique of worldviews like that of Marxism. This school of thinking argues that any worldview, as such, inevitably suppresses or overshadows the identity, particularity, of distinct existences. Let us first deal with the non-class argument. Caste, gender, and ethnicity, or other social categories, each have their specific characteristics and dynamics. Class analysis does not mean denying this. This is not the meaning of the centrality of class struggle. In fact, developing revolutionary class struggle and establishing it as the central task of all the oppressed demands that communists must address these specificities in theory and practice. Production and reproduction are the basics of human society in all its stages of development. When the development of production arrived at the stage of creating surplus, private property and exploitation of the labor of others became possible. Society divided into those who produce surplus through their labor and those who live off that surplus. It divided into the exploited and exploiters. This is the meaning of class division. The state, various forms of social division of labor, social institutions and customs, forms of ideology and culture, all of them served to perpetuate this division for the benefit of exploiters. The relations of reproduction were also molded to serve this aim. Through various stages of social development, all of these have been restructured. New ones have emerged. But so long as exploitation exists, all of them will serve the exploiters and impose their domination, their class dictatorship. Revolutionary class struggle, the struggle for communism, aims at, quote, the abolition of class distinctions generally, to the abolition of all the relations of production on which they rest, to the abolition of all the social relations that correspond to these relations of production, to the revolutionizing of all the ideas that result from these social relations, unquote. Karl Marx. Evidently, without addressing all the relations of oppression in a given society, such as caste, ethnic, gender, national, religious, and so on, there can be no revolutionary class struggle. Can the class stand, viewpoint, and method of the proletariat address all the varied forms of social oppression? Yes, it, and only it, can do this. We have noted that all the forms of social division of labor, social institutions, and forms of ideology of an exploitative society serve the interests of the exploiters. This means that all of them bear the mark of the class interests of the exploiters. All social constructs and relations in a class society are principally determined by and serve these class relations. Hence, they can be challenged and overthrown only by an ideology, an outlook, that identifies them in the ruling classes they serve and directs the struggle against this. Unlike all their exploited classes, the proletariat's outlook is the only one capable of doing this in a thoroughgoing and consistent manner because it is the last class in history. The proletariat was born with capitalism. Though capitalism has always used all the earlier forms of blatant exploitation like slavery and feudalism, by its nature it can, in principle, do away with all forms of extra economic coercion. All it needs is a working class that will sell its labor power. Capitalist exploitation can exist with formal equality without any form of birthright. It may thus be characterized as the, quote, purest, unquote, and most intense form of exploitation that has ever existed on earth. To gain liberation, the proletariat cannot be satisfied with ending any one form of exploitation or oppression. It must end all exploitation and oppression. This is why Marx and Engels declared that the proletariat can liberate itself only through the emancipation of all humanity, and that is why, unlike any variety of identity politics that can only take up one or the other aspect of social oppression, proletarian ideology, MLM, can take up the task of guiding the liberation of the exploited and oppressed in its totality. The Marxist position that class struggle is the way to end caste, ethnic oppression, or male domination means that revolutionary class struggle led by the proletariat has the potential to incorporate the struggles against such specific forms of oppression, but this will not be realized automatically. The all-embracing revolutionary potential of proletarian-led class struggle can be brought out only when the Communist Party consciously tackles the contradictions underlying such specific issues in order to make them current issues of class struggle, thereby developing class consciousness and training its ranks. If this is not done, the call for class struggle will only be an excuse for the desire to coexist with various forms of oppression. Proletarian consciousness cannot cohabit with caste, gender, ethnic, religious, or national consciousness, but this class consciousness does not emerge spontaneously from class existence. Working class existence also divides into two. Along with its historical position as a class that will end all relations of exploitation and oppression, 
is the situation of being divided by the mediums used by class exploitation, such as caste, gender, ethnicity, nationality, and religion, is also part of its objective class existence. Hence, the proletarian consciousness of struggle against class exploitation can only be developed by engaging with such contradictions as well. The proletariat can acquire a conscious grasp of its historical mission and unite all the streams of society rebelling against the old order into a grand torrent of revolution, only by strictly distinguishing between the oppressors and oppressed and their respective consciousnesses, by uniting with the struggling traditions of the oppressed, and by synthesizing the experiences of those struggles to the heights of class consciousness. Only then can its party attain the political, social, and cultural advantage of a true vanguard. One of the criticisms of Dalit identity politics is that the communist movement blocked the advance of Dalits through suppressing their caste identity by organizing them as agricultural laborers, i.e. as a class. Some even declare that whatever advance the Dalits could make was achieved only through their own organizations and struggle. The misrepresentation of historical facts is so blatant in this claim that we can just ignore it. What about the criticism on suppression of caste identity? If, as we have argued above, class struggle is a weapon for caste annihilation, then class organizing is certainly correct. This also calls for the development of class consciousness as opposed to caste consciousness. The problem with the communist movement in the past was not class organizing or the development of class consciousness. It was its wrong analysis of Dalit landless peasants as agricultural laborers and its politics of reformism, later revisionism, that could never develop proletarian class consciousness. Though the Communist Party took up struggle against caste oppression in its early period, this was guided by Gandhian Savarna reformism, not revolutionary Marxism. Once it turned to parliamentarism, even this was abandoned. This experience can be compared to that of the Maoist movement that emerged through the Naxalbari armed uprisings in 1967. The Maoists also took a long period to recognize the specificities of social oppression and develop a correct perspective. But unlike the old communist movement, its founders like Charu Mazumdar and Kanhai Chatterjee had an unwavering orientation of going to the bottommost levels of society, integrating with them, and leading their struggle for the seizure of political power. This created the context for the gradual realization of the errors in the thinking on the caste question and similar issues in its rectification. Its revolutionary practice and class line had already brought forth outstanding revolutionary leaders from the most depressed sections of our society. Over the past two decades, the struggle to develop a correct perspective and practice on such issues has become a vital part of the ideological line struggle within the Maoist movement. Thus, the potential of its ideology is now being more fully realized. This was possible because of its dedication to MLM stand that the total destruction of the existing social system and its state through armed struggle is the central task of any revolution. These arguments still won't satisfy those obsessed by postmodernism. They will see it as yet more proof of how a word view or meta narrative suppresses particular identities. An identity in itself generates a world view. So the issue is not whether we must have one or not. It is an attribute of all humans given our capacity to think. If we are interested in transforming the world, then we must seek out a world view capable of guiding us. Caste or similar identities are simply not up to this task. New Democratic Revolution We will now proceed to concretize class politics in the context of our country. Regardless of the religious beliefs of the ruler, caste feudalism was the norm in pre-colonial days. Shoots of local capitalism were emerging. They strengthened during the period of contention among colonial powers before British colonialism consolidated its controls. Feudal kings, like Tipu Sultan, in Mysuru, in Marthanda Varma, in Thiruvut Hamkur, have taken up some reforms of caste feudal relations. But once British colonialism seized total control, all of this was pushed back. Colonialism transformed caste feudalism only to the extent necessary for imperialist exploitation and plunder. Feudalism became the social base of imperialism. Imperialism generates a new type of capitalism, bureaucrat capitalism, and a new class, the comprador bureaucrat bourgeoisie. After the transfer of power in 1947, colonial, semi-feudal India became a semi-colonial, semi-feudal country, a country where various imperialists exploit, plunder, and intervene in all the realms of society, and is directly ruled by the alliance between the comprador bureaucrat bourgeoisie and feudal landlords. Imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism are our enemies. They are the three mountains weighing down on the backs of the people. The Indian state serves them by protecting and perpetuating all of the relations of exploitation and oppression. This state and the semi-colonial, semi-feudal social system it serves must be overturned through a new democratic revolution. It combines the tasks of national liberation and democratic revolution, the tasks of anti-imperialist and anti-feudal struggle. 
It is a new democratic revolution because unlike the democratic revolutions of the past led by the bourgeoisie, it has to be led by the proletariat. Our country is still mainly agrarian. The peasant masses, particularly the landless and poor peasants, are therefore the main forces of revolution. Agrarian revolution, i.e. the smashing of feudal relations, eliminating the landlords as a class, and implementation of land to the tiller, becomes the axis or main content of this revolution. Given the uneven balance of force between the enemies and the people, this revolution must follow the path of protracted people's war. It must be developed as a unified war in the countryside and cities, with the countryside as the center of gravity. This is the politics of new democratic revolution. There are those who argue that this is outdated in Kerala and other parts of India where class relations have been transformed. We cannot go into this here. But this much has to be stated. Those raising such arguments eliminate the anti-feudal struggle and thereby undermine all struggles against various forms and relations of social oppression. We will leave it at that and go on. All the specific issues of social oppression such as Dalit, Adivasi, women's, transgender, religious minority oppression, all the struggles to end them, must be guided by the politics of a new democratic revolution. These politics must be concretized and developed to address the specificities of each of them. Apart from that, the politics of new democratic revolution must also be concretized in the particularity of our country. The particular character of feudalism, i.e. caste feudalism, and the specific tasks arising from this must be identified and made an integral part of the new democratic revolution. The caste order was the organizing principle of feudalism. It was an integral part of its political, economic, social, and cultural structures. Brahmanism was its all-encompassing ideology. Some other issues need to be dealt with here before we go ahead. One is the charge made by some Dalit intellectuals that the call for an agrarian revolution is a new Savarna plot to keep the Dalits in the agrarian sector. First of all, those who raise this charge willfully ignore the fact that the vast majority of the Dalits are casual day wagers in the rural sector. No reservation or affirmative action is going to help this majority get out of this rut. Moreover, agriculture is the only fallback where there is economic stagnation. This was clearly seen during 2000 through 2002. Owning land is still an aspiration among the vast majority. Nowadays, a growing share of Dalit tenant peasants is a prominent feature of the agriculture scene. Another mistake made by these opponents of agrarian revolution is their refusal to acknowledge the need for a radical land reform that will forever end the castist character of land ownership. It is indeed an irony that these intellectuals who are angry with the CPI and CPM for their sham land reforms are vehemently opposed to rectifying this. A writer to this argument is that the Dalits and other oppressed must shun revolution because they will have to pay the highest price with their lives. This is the talk of the petite bourgeoisie concerned about upsetting their seemingly secure existence. The whole history of humanity is the history of repeated uprisings and rebellions by the bottommost sections of society. They suffered most from the existing exploitative system. Therefore, they were the most determined in struggle, willing to pay any price. This was so in the past, and it is so today, and will be in the future too. It comes from their own realization that there can be no greater price than the lives ground to dust daily by miserable existence enforced by the exploitative system. This is the logic of struggle, of why the people rise up again and again in struggle, despite failures and betrayals. Another charge is that the politics of new democracy is yet another way of deceiving the Dalits, since caste annihilation will not be achieved just by destroying feudalism. Yes, it is true that the completion of the new democratic revolution is not going to end caste. Neither is it going to end women's oppression or other forms of social oppression. The struggles to achieve this will be long drawn out. As the experiences of erstwhile socialist countries show, it will be a very important part of the struggle to maintain a socialist orientation and advance to communism. But that does not mean that the new democratic revolution won't change anything. It will smash the foundations of social oppression in all its forms and create favorable grounds for developing the struggle to rid society of these evils once and for all. Most importantly, it will give the oppressed a powerful tool, their state, which they can wield to emancipate themselves. A large part of the struggle on such issues in the future socialist society will be ideological, educational, to transform worldview. Along with that, the struggle to establish, maintain, and develop specific policies and structures in the political, social, cultural realms, and in the economy that tackle and help overcome the disadvantages carried over from the old society by different sections, like the Dalits, Adivasis, women, religious and other minorities, nationalities, and backward regions, will also have to be advanced. New democratic revolution is the first step in this long journey. The struggle to annihilate caste and smash the grip of Brahmanism is not just a matter of anti-feudal struggle. 
bureaucrat capitalism engendered by imperialism in the oppressed countries, and the comprador bureaucrat bourgeoisie that grows up as the big bourgeoisie in these countries, exist forever intertwined with feudalism. This is not a compromise, as argued by the CPM and CPI, but an inseparable urge born of its class character. Brahmanism is very much a part of the Indian comprador bureaucrat bourgeoisie's world outlook. This is not a simple continuation of the Brahmanism of the Smritis or Sankara. It was remolded during the colonial period to suit the interests of the emerging Indian big bourgeoisie and the sections of feudal lords keen on seizing emerging opportunities in close company with them. It continues to be remolded by the ruling classes. The direction of this remolding is a matter of contention among them, but all are united in clinging to Brahmanism. It is contained in the very core of the Indian ruling classes, in their state, exploitation, and oppression. Not just in the caste question, a stamp can be seen in all of its ideology, politics, culture, and practice and the caste order, as a part of semi-feudalism, serves imperialism and the ruling classes. This provides a powerful basis to bring out the struggle against caste and Brahmanism from the comparatively narrower frame of the Dalit issue without reducing the role of specific struggle on the Dalit question. It also implies that the caste issue, or any of the other issues, cannot be dealt with in a piecemeal reformist manner, separated from the central task of seizing political power by destroying the Indian state. The struggle to annihilate caste and smash Brahmanism is therefore not just a matter of Dalit emancipation. It is equally vital in the women's, Adivasi, transgender, nationality, and religious minority struggles for emancipation. In other words, it is vital for the new democratic revolution and their further struggle to build socialism and communism. One of the most notable contributions of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar was his recognition of the central role of the struggle to annihilate caste and his stress on the need to dynamite the ideology sustaining it. He conceived of this ideology as a religion, as Hinduism. This was one of the strong bases for his leading a mass conversion of Dalits into Buddhism. But as we can well see, religious conversion has not ended caste oppression, nor has any religion been resistant to Brahmanism. Though Hindu theology is Brahmanic, we should distinguish between the religious beliefs of the people and this ideology. The ideology of Brahmanism must be fought against in philosophy, culture, and the value system. It cannot be restricted to Hinduism. All the religions existing here are infected by it to a greater or lesser degree. Therefore, it is correct to amend Embedkar and call for a dynamiting Brahmanism, as we have explained earlier, this calls for class struggle, which means breaking away from the constitutionalism of Embedkar. Only then can we really take up and synthesize his contributions. To sum up, each form of social oppression has its specificity, but all of them share the common characteristic of emerging from and serving the exploitative system. None, neither the Dalits, Adivasis, women, transgenders, Muslims, nor any other social section can achieve emancipation if this is lost sight of. This common characteristic they share and their specificities can be grasped simultaneously and addressed only by proletarian ideology, MLM, and class struggle, the new democratic revolution that it leads. This is the only consistent revolutionary politics of liberation.